All right, take two. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Purple Pew. I'm your host, Purple Kurt. With me today is none other than legendary saxophonist, flutist, arranger, instrumentalist, keyboardist, Mr. Eric Leeds. To those of us in the greater music community, we would best know him by working with Prince, the family, and then eventually went on and did his own solo records. Uh, Times Squared, Things Left Unsaid under the Paisley Park monitor, moniker, uh, went on to do his third solo album, Now and Again, currently is uh, got an album out with this cat, Mr. Paul Peterson, and the artwork behind me here, No Words, available on leadspetersonmusic.com. I got myself the autographed copy off of uh, eBay, worth the extra money, if I, if I may say so, and it's a wonderful album. Uh, so. First of all, I before I even get started railing you with questions, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. We we have had uh, as we're talking about we had a, yes. a brutal brutal winter here in Minneapolis, yes, you have. and the last few days we have been in the upper 80s, which is about 30 to 35 degrees above normal right now. Ugh. And what's odd about it, I was out riding my bike yesterday. Oh, cool. It was, eight, it was 85, but there were still little mounds of snow, you know, along, which is just odd and feel 85 degrees and still see little mounds of snow sitting, you know, that, at inter intersections of, of streets. It's not that, that would be more weather akin to Colorado, where my brother has a house outside of a Colorado Springs. It's schizophrenic weather like that out there. Yeah. One day it'll be 12 inches of snow. The next day it'll be 70 some degrees. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, we're, we're going to get over the weekend, we're going to get back to what's normal here about maybe mid 50s for, you know, so we're back, you know, we've had three, four days of summer and now we're crazy. going back to spring. This is so, crazy. This is yeah. great. Well, you're welcome. I, I know you uh, liked the warmer weather. Ironically, yeah. you living in the Minneapolis area. All well, these I'm, years I'm, later. I'm, I'm getting out of here as soon as I can. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and actually heading, as you may have, may have known, I lived in Richmond, Virginia yes. for several years when I was yes. a kid. Yes. That's where I'm planning to go back. Okay. Uh, guess yeah. what? My, my father's uh, sister, Barbara, lives in the Richmond area. Okay. We're going we're gonna to meet up. If you yeah, need any help cool. with the moving boxes and your and all your records, <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have said that. I'll, I'll absolutely, yeah. Now I have no I have no timetable. I I actually would have possibly made the move already, but when the pandemic kind of shut everything down for right. years, that just kind of put anything on a lot of other things on the back burner. But that's still my game plan is to get get back to someplace warmer and back to the East Coast. So. Well, I tell you, once you get past and, you know, having driven down I the I-95 corridor a time or two myself, you know all too well, once you get past that DC corridor, uh, the, the pit of hell, the, the Dante's yep. infernal concentric circle of hell that is the yep. DC traffic, yep. and then you got National Harbor to get past and all that to get to Richmond. It's, it's a little bit of a hike, but yeah, it's beautiful. Richmond has trains. You're... you're I dare say your other obsession besides yes. music, even yeah. to maybe a greater degree, at least an equal degree. An equal there, degree. there are okay. there are th there are simply three legs to to my chair, my stool: the music, trains, and baseball. That's it. I tell you what, have you ever? Okay, so we're going to throw it out. So music, we're obviously going to talk about. That's why we're here. But the trains, let, let me let me engage you a little bit about that, because I, I told you I'm going to try to keep this as Prince adjacent as, as I possibly can, because you Lord knows uh, when you're on Michael Dean's podcast, we call that the gospel, according to Eric Leeds, amongst us Prince fans, because uh -oh. you gave us a you gave us a lot of facts, figures and information that I don't really want to ask any questions about that kind of stuff, because I feel like, you know. You've been there, done that, bought the there, done it, yeah. and, and got yeah. it, it, it fit something better at 50%. So my question about uh, uh, trains mm -hmm. and the uh, Gage's discussion, I've only ever rode 
what's known as two, two vintage trains. And I have a very dear friend of mine in Baltimore who uh, works for the B&O Railroad Museum, should you ever... Oh, I, yeah. I, I mean, I have not been there, but I mean, that's on my list of things to do. Yeah. We'll hook you up. Okay. Trust and Great. believe for you. Oh, well, you're taking your time, but we'll make sure you get you get uh, you get to visit there. Cool. Uh, it's uh, and I've actually never been in there myself, so that might mm -hmm. be a road trip uh, in the future. But um, when I was in Silverton, Colorado, my grandparents live in Grand Junction, Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the Silverton narrow gauge rail yep. system. You familiar with that? Ever been Rango to it? and Silverton, and then there's also the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic that's down there also. Okay. Now, near Cripple Creek Casino in Colorado, other end, is that, that, there was another kind of, uh, I can't, I don't remember if it was a narrow gauge railroad that I rode, but you got the little mm -hmm. coal ashes on you. It was a much mm -hmm. smaller train. And if you mm -hmm. weren't careful, you could, <laughs> you could singe your jacket. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, that, those are incredible experiences uh, being on those yeah. trains. But I will hook you up with a friend of mine who, who, uh, has no idea probably about you or your music, but he is very into the whole train experience and oh, cool. rides the trains yeah. and is a, uh, a, a docent of sorts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. Now, as far as baseball is concerned, have you ever been to, um, now I live in the Philly metro area. I'm in Conshohocken, about mm -hmm. 12, 13 miles outside of Philly city, home yeah. to quest love your, your buddy. Oh yeah. Um, have you ever been to the Philly stadium and or my home in Baltimore, Maryland to the Camden yards? I have not been to this state. I, I've been to the old Philly Stadium, Memorial Stadium back in the yeah. 70s. Oh, sure, sure. But not, the, but not the new one. Have not been to Camden Yards yet. Um, you got to go to Camden Yards. It's oh, yeah, those, no, I, yeah. Ab absolutely. Well, absolutely. If, if and when you move to Richmond, that that's definitely a trip you're going to have to make. Oh, ab absolutely. Now, my the thing about my, my baseball, I'm primarily a Yankee fan. Oh, that's fine. I know. I got I'm, you. Also, I'm also still a lifelong Dodger fan. Uh -huh. So that that a lot of my baseball buddies don't, you know, they give me a lot of shit about that because how do you reconcile that? I haven't quite figured it out anyway. But it's okay. You know, I'm a Baltimore yeah. Ravens fans among among the uh, the Eagles fans up here, you know, and, and you know yeah. you know the Phillies fans are diehard sports fans. I don't have to tell you you already know. Well, I mean, growing growing up in the in the years that I was in Pittsburgh, of course, you know, I was a pirate fan, you know, also yeah. during those years, and of course sure. the pirate Philly um rivalry particularly during the 70s when both teams were absolutely great yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but uh i got to see <clears throat> uh the second to last game that uh in in the orioles world cal ripkin oh it was a wow. game that actually was scheduled on september 11th 2001 and they rescheduled obviously to September 16th, 2001. So I got to see Cal's, I didn't get to see the, you know, the, the very last game that he played, mm -hmm. but I got to see him sitting in section 28 right by the dugout and saw Eddie, um, oh, help me out. Eddie, Eddie Murray. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Eddie Murray is a, as a yeah. first base coach, I believe. Or yeah, he was by then, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you know more about baseball than I do, as you can tell. Well, Eddie yeah. Murray was just, a, I mean, for a coach, he was just, you know, one of the great players, I mean, and, and a Baltimore icon. For right. years and he also played for the Dodgers years years later yes. too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. but the last time I went to a baseball game, ironically, I uh took a pil pilgrimage to Minneapolis this summer and saw Prince Knight with your team, the Yankees, playing against the twins. Ah, and yeah. uh what beautiful weather. Just yeah. gorgeous weather for that. Yeah. Um, but that's the last time I've been to a last time I've been to a ball game. So yeah, Philly Stadium is nice, but you really have to hit Camden Yards. I'm just going to throw that out. Oh, no, it's I want to hit Camden Yards. I have been to the new Pittsburgh Stadium, which is also absolutely gorgeous. The yeah, Pittsburgh Stadium is tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. of course, you know, we're, we're you're not a football guy, but, uh, you know, no. being a, you know, not our division rivalry that used to be, I don't think is as much anymore with the Steelers versus the Ravens, but, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I go back to meeting Johnny Unitas when I was seven years old, and, ah, and he still okay. had the Golden Arm Lounge off of york road <laughs> now it's a giant supermarket yeah, and yeah. uh but i got to meet him you know what back in the days when, when you went to supper with your grandparents you had to wear the coat and tie you know there's sure. a certain age and station where you had to do that right you know, you know. Yeah. um okay so hey listen baseball and yeah. trains we could i'm sure you would rather probably talk about that oh i could um, sit on all day with that yeah i'm sure 
I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, your your uh, your musical path and your journey is a very unique one, as as uh, everybody's journey is. But now here you are. Your father was a retail store operations guy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, department uh, store Herbert. retailer. Yeah. And uh, your mom, Dorothy. Uh, was she active in that world as well or well she actually did she she was you know coincidentally she was from saint paul right yes. um and which was a coincidence in, in in you know both my brother and i ending up in the twin cities um at a very young age she went to new york she had gone to the university of minnesota but she went to nyu uh, to get a master's degree in retailing oh wow. but she never she never pursued a career in it because you know, in those days, you get married, you're a housewife, you got two sons. Mm -hmm. And and both my brother and I, you know, have often thought about in, in today's context, somebody yeah. like my mother, mm -hmm. would she have pursued a career like that? And perhaps, you know, yeah. a whole different, a whole different time. Yeah. But yeah. I'm sure your mom and dad had conversations about stuff and that she definitely probably lent some input to that. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you come from a very astute uh, uh, background. You know, I mean, uh, I, I I can premise everything. Boy, you know, this it sounds like the the corniest cliche in the world, but it's um, I had two parents that all they wanted for me and my brother was for us to do what we wanted to do. Yep. Well, and mission fulfilled. <laughs> to and say the least and then some much, and then yeah, some yeah and and you know i was doubly blessed with the support of my parents being so inclusive of, of me and alan when we were kidding so many things um when we were growing up and uh, i mean obviously I, I i was extraordinarily fortunate to grow up in in a circumstance where um but to put it bluntly i never wanted for anything yeah, in that regard too. Um, so I mean, it's it's um, <laughs> you know any anything else that might have might have or have not worked out in in my life or career, I'm not somebody that has the right to complain about much of anything. Right. So, and, and look, but you know. but at least you're great. You 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 seem like you're full of gratitude. If it, but but at the same time, you've possessed this. Uh, <clears throat> how do I put this, this pragmatism that many, well, yeah, but many working musicians, you know, who get too attached to the emotional BS Hollywood, you mm -hmm. know, side of things try and fail miserably because they don't separate church and state, so to speak, in the entertainment and the music world. And, you know, having yeah. been a veteran of bar bands and, and mm -hmm. being on the road, and and all the trappings that follow that you didn't seem like you that that impacted you much at all you didn't get into any of the you didn't get into as much a, a so-called good trouble as you probably could have had possibly you in know, the I 70s mean, dear god <laughs> well you know i i um in the years you know when in my bar band years um for year and that year after year, whether it was my own band or the band that I was um, in for four years from 79 through 82 with a singer named Billy Price. Yes. And I would tell anybody that's listening, just Google Billy Price. He's you, still at you, it. And, th and thank me in the morning. He is still at it. And he is um, as great a singer as and band leader that I, I ever, you know, was associated with. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm somewhat of, <laughs> I'm, my, I'm my own journalist and um, kept itineraries and journals of all of my gigs through the years. Yes, you did. And in the four years that I was with the Billy Price Band, I played 981 gigs. And people now look at this, well, that's crazy. But, you know, back in those days in the bar band, that's what we did. Because it was like, this was my gig. Oh, I went to work. Instead of going to work in an office or a factory or an auto mechanic shop or whatever, I went to work in whatever nightclub we were playing that night. But and so, you, but you, but you kept your now as a singer. For, for speaking for myself, nine hundred eighty-six gigs. You better be. You better be like a choir boy. <laughs> yeah, and and you know that's that's three three sets a night. 
you, you know, and and Billy Billy was the kind of of uh, performer and showman still is that his determination when he hits the stage is that when we're done, you're going to remember us. Yeah, you know, and yeah. to that extent, yeah. I in those 981 gigs, there was never one instance where he wasn't out there presenting him and us mm -hmm. to our max. Yeah. I, I, I remember one night in, in particular, um, mm -hmm. we got booked into it. We were on the road and somewhere in upstate New York, I remember Syracuse or Rochester, someplace like that. We got booked into a club that you could tell as soon as we hit the stage, this was not going to be our audience. This was more of a dance disco kind of club. And it was, it was just a total misbooking. Yeah. And it was one of those gigs where a lot of times you might say, you know, the band leader, or whatever said, okay, guys, it's obvious. This is not going to be a place we're probably ever going to come back to. Let's just, let's just get the, the more dance oriented songs. Let's just do the gig, get paid and get the hell out of here and just chalk this one up as, you know, misbooking. Sure. And for Billy you, was, Billy wasn't that though. Billy went out that night and performed every bit of the show songs that we would normally do with our audience. Sure. Realizing that most of the people weren't going to even be paying us any attention. Yeah. But his basic attitude was, if we're going to fail, we're going to fail by doing what we do. Mm -mm -mm. No? I, I feel, I feel it. I, yeah. Listen, I, I, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you cut your teeth with a guy like Billy Price and that, you know, uh, going back to your history a little bit, um, when you were 14, I mean, leading up to your days at Duquesne and, and working with mm -hmm. guys like Billy Price, you certainly cut your teeth on, you know, how to manage in, in the music world in, in one area. And, you know, you're, you're, experiences you know going on to the bigger tours that you would again do with prince mm -hmm. particularly something as technically complex and uh, as like the love sexy tour was oh yeah you yeah. know all the different hydraulic i mean that's the first time i would see you september 30th 1988 hartford connecticut i kept my okay. own journal <laughs> <laughs> okay. and uh what did you have for breakfast that day eric quick get your journal the kid i'm kidding you know, I could tell you what I probably because it was probably every day that I had the same, you know, yeah. bacon and eggs. <laughs> you know? Ooh, okay. All right. uh, uh, cheers to that. They got yeah. good bacon in Richmond when you get there. So let me yeah. tell you. Um, so, but you, you know, you go back to your childhood mm -hmm. uh, at 14, well, teenagehood, yep. and you getting to know James Brown through your brother, Alan. I mean, it's well known that your brother, you know, eventually went on to work for James and you my got brother, to, my, bro, I, I'm a, my brother's yep. book. Yep. Plug it away. I've Plug got away. it on my Kindle and I, I want to talk to your brother at some point and that I will definitely plug the hell out of that because it's sure. on my list of books to read. I just got to get through the next couple of weeks and I can get back to read. <laughs> yeah. You know how it is. You know how it mm -hmm. is when you're on tour, when you, you got gigs going on, you don't have time for nothing else, but to, you know, do your thing. So, uh, you got to meet James Brown when you were 14 and you saw this, what would eventually be your life and how you wanted it to look like by playing the saxophone. Right. So yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and the used saxophone that you eventually bought at a music shop because your uncle played for Perry Como, correct? Right. Yeah. My uncle, uncle Phil, um, Phil Zalk, and he was a member of uh, the Mitchell Ayers um, orchestra, which was Perry Como's. And from the like the late 50s to the early 60s, Perry Como had a weekly NBC variety show that was, you know, one of the biggest shows on what, TV back then. And I have a question for you on that. Mm -hmm. um, was that the other Ray Charles involved in that particular yes. show? Right. Ray Charles, the Ray Charles singers. They were as the an horse. elementary music teacher, we used to yeah. teach 50 new the United States from 13 original. Uh, that colonies. that was a, that was a, a series that they did for yes, weeks. They did. Where, they take every week, they would take one state and do a thing on, on that state. Yeah. I've seen a clip where Paul Robeson, the famous black opera singer, uh, mm -hmm. actually did one of the segments on that. Yeah. So is it, well, as a matter, so, matter of fact, um, 
Ray Charles, my Ray Charles, yes, appeared with his band, his full orchestra, on the Perry Como show. This was probably would have been around 60 or 61. Okay. And he did what I say, of course, is, you know, signature song. Okay. And of course, they had to corny it up. So they brought in the Ray Charles singers to sing with the Ray Letts. What, the... what I yeah oh no it was it was it was god wow. awful I mean it really was but the funny thing was is that their Ray Charles <laughs> came on stage to introduce himself to my Ray Charles and of course they did a joke about it where um, this Ray Charles who was uh, just so everyone knows Ray Charles couldn't have been whiter than right you know. Right. Mm -hmm. So Ray, that Ray Charles introduces himself to my Ray Charles and said, I'm Ray Charles, I'm the singers. And then my Ray Charles says, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Their Ray Charles says, oh, you already have it. Ha, ha, ha. That oh, was the God. job. I, of course. You, know, that, that's, I, you, you know. answered a question for me that I wanted to know, and I probably wouldn't have known had you not brought it up, is did Ray Charles meet Ray Charles? Because when I taught this to my elementary students, and we're talking kindergarten through fifth grade. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a requirement I had for them to learn the 50 states, you know, and many music Got teachers it. had that in their, yeah. in their back pocket. Mm -hmm. um, and fun fact, you probably already know this, but fun fact, rate the, uh, not your Ray Charles, but the Ray Charles from Perry Como show wrote and sang and performed on the three company TV show theme. That's his voice. Come and knock on our door. Come really? Knock. I'll be damned. I didn't that is that. Ray Charles. Wow. Sir. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> kind of like Vic Mizzy doing the uh, da 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 da. Right? Oh, right. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 I, I listen, yeah. I love my music geekdom. I embrace it. You know, I love those little facts. But uh, yeah, hey, listen, we're, we're never too old to learn new stuff every day, right? So, you know, yeah, I love stuff. Absolutely. Like that. I love fact that. Who, That's who so produced, cool that who, produ who, produced, who produced Leslie Gore's most famous song, It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To? Quincy Jones. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah quincy uh, jones and and quincy jones first number one hit as well on now, billboard charts if i'm not um mistaken. another thing about my family i'm talking about my uncle phil who was a tenor yes. saxophone with the yeah. mitchell airs yeah uh, his wife was my my aunt florence who was my father's sister florence came up in the music business yeah she worked for an entertainment lawyer in new york in the 40s by the name of johnny gluskin who handled Tommy Dorsey, a oh, very sure. young Frank Sinatra. Mm. And then she became assistant for uh, the Charles Hansen Publishing Company, which okay. was one of the biggest music publishing companies. Mm -hmm. She went later to work for Edward Marks, which was one of the other biggest. But anyway, with mm. Hansen, she, she knew Quincy Jones. Mm. And... Wow. Um, my, my Aunt Florence was, um, what was that movie that was several years ago with Meryl Streep, The Devil Wears Prada, I think yes. it was called. Oh, she was that the uh, Miranda, that would have been, Press, Miranda Priestly character? Yeah, that would have been my my aunt in, in a later day. That was what my, my Aunt Florence was, you know, she was absolutely incredible in that regard. Wow. So years, decades later, this was 1988, Quincy Jones came into Minneapolis to Paisley Park one day sure. just to visit and hang out. During so the first bad time tour I, for Michael, I think? Right? Yeah, we, we were in production rehearsals for the Love Sexy tour. Okay. And Quincy came in to hang for a few days. Oh, and I introduced man. myself to him. I said, Miss Jones, whatever. I said, I wanted to ask you um, if you remembered knowing my aunt named Florence Leeds. You would have known her back probably in the early 50 mid early mid mid 50s right <laughs> he looked at me and he said it said Florence Leeds he said once you meet Florence Leeds you'll never forget Florence Leeds oh after uh, probably been you know 34 you know 30 years since they had spoken or whatever but it was anyway I said anyway that's so yeah that, that's my Quincy Jones story so, that's so but see here's the thing Eric, and, and I think you'll appreciate this. I, I think you already appreciate it. But for many of us that grew up in the 80s, 
And we hear these, I've never heard you tell that story. And I've listened to quite a few interviews that you've told. So thank you for sharing that. You give, you give these gems. You have so many of these. Please do us all a favor. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Write a goddamn book. Please. I'm sorry if I... I, I, I am going to write a, I am gonna write a book, but it's, it's going to be about trains. It's going to be train. <laughs> Damn it. Come on. No, seriously. But seriously, though, thank you for thank you for these stories that you're sharing, because in in our world, you're like what they, the African storyteller, the griot. Well, you really are. Because well, wait, wait until you talk to my brother, because oh, I, I mean, I, he, I, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I would look forward to that. And um, well, my my incidentally about, you know, just going back to the background, this has even more um, influence on on how my brother, you know, and, and his career tra trajectory. Yeah. Um, my other uncle, who was my dad's younger brother, Mel, Melvin Leeds, mm -hmm. he was in radio. Yes. And he actually started out being kind of like a road manager for whatever they called him in the day for, for Gene Krupa back in the oh, 40s. Sure. Drummer. Yep. Um, yep. And he was um, went into radio. He was in Kansas City for a while, came back to New York in the mid 50s, and he was the program director, station manager for WINS okay. in New York when yes. they literally created the top 40 radio format. Alan Freed, Murray the K, Cousin Brucie, they all went through Wins Radio at one point in time. My uncle had, you know, was involved in all of their careers. Those um, names you just threw out there. I mean, Alan Freed, yeah. who is given credit, and there's some debate on this, that he coined the term rock and roll, but there's still right. some yeah. debate yeah. about that. But Murray the yeah. K... Larry yeah. Kay had one of those voices that you know. Oh yeah. Now I, I, there's tapes with him, and I'm a big Brian Wilson uh, fan. Beach okay. Boys and Brian Wilson. I mean, you, how can you ignore those guys? And Brian's arrangements and harmonies and unorthodox mm -hmm. instrumentation. Sure. And you know, many interviews with Murray the K on these box sets that they have for the Beach Boys. I mean, you yep. it artists like you had to break on radio with a guy like Murray the King. And I'm sure Paola probably was involved to-, to Well, that, that, was a, that was another aspect. <laughs> that was another part of the story. Um, yeah, yeah. That, uh, I, I mean, look, I, I'm, not tell, I, I'm not telling tales out of school. No, um, you're not. My, my uncle, Mel, Alan Freed, and, and a very infamous um, guy named Jack Hook, who was Alan Freed's manager, who was yeah. also involved in the music business for years after that. Um, they were all indicted on payola. <laughs> my uncle, very fortunately, the indictment against my uncle was uh, revoked. Okay. The basic story was um, everyone was after Alan Freed for very obvious reasons, politically and socially. This is 1960. Because Alan Freed was the white Jew, excuse me, who was promoting concerts where, heaven forbid, white kids and black kids were in concerts sure. all together. So basically, you know, politically and otherwise, yep. there was a lot, there were a lot of people where they were out to get Alan Freed because Alan Freed was the guy who was corrupting our precious youth. Got it. Well, and you no. Know, I, I mean, it, it, it is, is, is as paranoid and, and, and ridiculous as that sounds, doesn't make it any less true because, because of it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, if I may, so I, I know you come from a Jewish background, yep. as you've mentioned many times before. On my father's side, yeah. On your father's side. Yep. Um, were you guys, I mean, was, were you basically on the secular side of things? Did you attend temple? Mostly um, we, we, we did. Uh, when we lived in Milwaukee, um, my dad actually became the president of um, a, ver a very, very reformed congregation, a new congregation. Mm -hmm. And we used to laugh about it. it was so reformed that when we went to temple for Yom Kippur, there was a sign on the door that said close for the holidays. That, that was our joke. <laughs> um, it, it was probably as secular um, a congregation as you could get. Yeah. Uh, both my brother and I went to Sunday school. Um, neither one of us were bar mitzvahed. By the okay. time we moved, moved to Virginia, to Richmond, we, we, 
continue going to Sunday school. My brother was confirmed, which was basically meant that he went through Sunday yeah, school Catholic. until he was a senior or whatever. Okay. By the time we moved to Pittsburgh, I basically kind of told my parents, I'm not getting anything out of this. I'd really like to let the Sunday school go. And at that point, my mom and dad said, you know something, um, that's fine. Cool. So, well, respect yeah. to that. I get it. Yeah. But, yeah. um, you know, I just wonder if that had a, a direct impact in your life, certainly with your uncle and well, adjacent to your uncle, a guy like uh, you know, cu- cult- culture, culturally and socially, it certainly did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. How could it not? I mean, you know, Matt it, it, Fink and yeah. I talked very briefly about about his uh, background. He would when he was on with me uh, a couple months mm-hmm. ago, and uh, you know, basically the same thing. I think you and Matt probably would have had conversations about, or I don't oh, know. Sure. If I'm sure you. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and you know, um, oh he's he does imitations of his his, his relatives. I tell you, I, I just, I was crying with laughter. He's so oh, his, damn his, funny. His, his, his parents, both of them, his mom and dad were great. They, they were, you know, terrific. Yeah, you got to know them. You know, they, yeah. I, I, talking to him about his parents, again, you guys come from a similar background where, you know, he didn't necessarily want for anything either and had a great mm-hmm. upbringing and, you know, the resources financially to get the instruments that he wanted. And, and, yeah. and but, but you're guys that don't take that for granted. I hope not. I, no. I really hope not. Yeah. No, listen. Yeah. But you keep it a buck. You keep it a hundred, as they say in the streets. You know, you keep it. Well, you keep I, it. I, I get that as much from my mother as anything else. You, you know, I, 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 once again, a cliche, but I, I, I can't help it. If my mother was somebody who was so completely comfortable in her own skin and so unpretentious yep. um, and just so um, effortlessly confident about knowing who she was and what she was. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I can honestly say if everyone in the world was like my mom, <laughs> everything would be fine. You know? I'll tell you, yeah. I, I yeah. echo that sentiment. My mom is 80 years old, still works full-time doing medical records for the number one second opinion doctor worldwide at Johns mm-hmm. Hopkins for prostate and bladder cancer in men and you name it a name producer she says kurt there are people i wish i could tell you the names but you know well, HIPAA I, laws. you know it's very possible that he might have been the person that or his department that looked at my biopsy when i was diagnosed with prostate cancer well dr epstein is his name and he unlike 10 he sees ten thousand slides a day eric mm-hmm. ten th- she's going to be 80 this august we're taking her to ireland for her 80th and well, that- she doesn't look it, doesn't sound mm-hmm. it. And like your mom, I yeah. aspire to have her excellent turn of phrase. She was an educator for many years and then mm-hmm. be, got in medical transmission. But this is what makes us who we are. And the fact that you, yeah. you hey, you know, sounds like a great, great background. Would have loved to have met them. Uh, it, yep. it sounds like I would have I would have gotten a lot out. Well, two, in 2005, um, my biopsy came back they, my, my doctor here sent um, the result, sent the, you know, the, the biopsy information uh-huh. to John Hopkins because he wanted it looked at by uh-huh. the best. Okay. And yeah. there was one, there was one note that came back positive. I had the surgery several months later. Okay. Um, that was in 2006. Okay. As, as, as my, as my, as my <laughs> sister-in-law would say, I'm, I'm still vertical. <laughs> Do, let me tell you. So that was, and then that was prostate cancer. Uh, well, yeah. uh, okay. First I of would, all, I was the po- I was the poster boy for the best case scenario. They caught it at a, 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 your PSA in initial levels stages. And all that. I I I was so fortunate. I didn't even have to go through any kind of chemotherapy or anything. It was basically have the surgery, and I was good. And, and well, yeah, you may not yeah. have gone to Sunday school, but I'm about to do this to you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you did go, but you're not. Yeah. Hey, listen, whatever you believe in, I, you, you, you were lucky. You're a lucky man on that one. I, I know people. I were, believe in the doctors at John Hopkins. You know, oh, like yeah, your sure. mother. Yeah. Well, my mom, my mom jokes with Dr. Epstein and says, you know, doctor, you know, doc, for you've made an Irish Catholic girl's dream come true. I get to talk to men about their bladders and prostates all day. Long. <laughs> and that's go. her. <laughs> that's, that's who I grew up with. That turn yep. of phrase, the sense of humor. 
and the music. I was turned on to so much 70s R&B and funk and rock and all the good stuff, all the old stuff that was eight track and LP worthy back in the day. Right, so, yeah. yeah. So uh, I can thank her for my love of, of music that uh, eventually would lead me to your world and your and your uh, uh, circle. So, okay, so we can blame her. Blame your mom. Okay, I, I, and I'm sure she would take all the blame, and she'll be eventually watch this and be like, "You're damn right." <laughs> so, oh, this is great. I, I, see, this is the kind of interview I wanted. I, I, I was hoping to get, and I know you're 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 an easy guy to 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 talk to. I could tell, but you're giving you. us gems and things that I I hope are going to be refreshing for you because. Uh, you know, and obviously I want to get to LP music with your buddy, Paul Peterson, who I'd love to have on here. Hint, sure. hint, Paul, if you're out there, I had been trying to talk to David, but you know, my schedule and his, you know, and I know he's got the whole uh, St. Mi the Minneapolis funk all-stars thing happening. Yeah. In yeah. fact, um, he actually talked me into joining them for a gig uh, here at the Dakota oh. um, on the 28th. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm, you heard it here first folks. Yeah. Yeah. Eric is, and I wish I could come. I'm going to be yep. in the v Victoria. No, I won't. Actually, I'll be back. I don't know if I can make it, but boy, maybe I'll nope. call in sick. And fly to see. <laughs> now, are there, I know, are you ever going to tour? If you come back in the Richmond area, is there ever a possibility you would do some gigging in the East Coast ever, maybe? Um, I have no idea. I, I mean, at, at this point um, in my life and career, whatever, um, <clears throat> whatever circumstances present themselves or what I would, you know, okay. take advantage of. Um, there are some musicians that, you know, friends of mine up in the, in the New York area that being back on the East Coast could make it maybe, you know, logistically yeah, sure. more conceivable that something like that could happen. Um, at my age, the, the rigors of going out on the road are, more of an issue than they would have been even five or ten years ago okay. um so it, it 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 you know the circumstances there are a lot of a lot of things that kind of have to line up in a way sure. that you know but but yeah i mean it, I, I i would still love to be able to go out and play the music i want to play with the musicians i want to play it and be able to at the end of the night have a few bucks left over to at least pay my cab fare home <laughs> <laughs> Or my Uber uh, fare or whatever, you know. Yeah. Don't we all wish that in the age of streaming content, you know, where yeah. music now is essentially like tap being treated like tap water? Yeah. Where, you know, I know, yeah. I know, I get it. Listen, that's why mm -hmm. I bought a physical copy of this album. Once again, we're going to plug that again. Do you mind if we throw a little track on here? Uh, I, Not at all. The copyright police isn't going to get me since you, I'm talking to no, one of the we, artists on this album. Yeah, we we own everything. So we'll, Good. Uh, on behalf of Paul Peterson and myself, have at it. <laughs> uh, thank you. So I wanted to put the title track on uh, from No Words, No Words, and just hear a little snippet of that if I can. Can you hear it? I did for a second. I don't hear it now. There it is. Yeah. Okay, great. I always forget to get the noise suppression on. get a little snippet there I, I i always feel like it's sacrilege when i stop something but i have questions about it obviously uh sure. first of all i picked it deliberately because 
you know, for many of us, you're known as a saxophonist. We also know you for playing the flute, obviously. But, um, you know, the choice of flute, and I believe, is it fretless bass? Yeah. yeah Paul, okay. I think Paul was playing fretless on that, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a certain part of the song where it sounds like a doorbell is ringing. Um, and I don't know that if you, if you catch it, go back and listen to it. It's like about halfway through the song. I, there's like chimes or something, and I thought my yeah. doorbell went off. Yeah. It's, it's but, some of the hand percussion that I might have put on it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. Why F sharp minor? Um. Why not? <laughs> okay, no, no. I just see these are yeah. the things that go um, through my head. So the um, if if I recall, it was I wrote it on the piano. I write pretty much everything I do on the on the on the piano. Cool. And it just happened to be where my hands were. <laughs> cool. <laughs> For okay. whatever I mean, the chord. Can be no, yeah, yeah. It can be just now. As now the real the real the real insight is is the title of the song. Mm -hmm. Um, and um. Paul and I had been doing gigs, you know, around town several years ago right. um, with this. And it was kind of a, um, we had a surrounding kind of a, a revolving cast of characters that would sure. in, in town here, we, we do gigs with. Um, we always tried to get Stokely Williams to play drums with us. Of course, Stokely, the lead singer with Mid Condition and is in his own albums now. But Stokely is just an absolute, just fabulous drummer. Yes. Um, any, anyway, um, I, we had a gig one night and I went over to Paul's to pick him up. We we're going to drive down to the gig together. And I've known Paul's wife. Her name is Julie. Mm -hmm. We've been friends for decades, as long as I've known Paul. And I laughed and she's, you know, and I looked at Julie and I said, um, you're not coming to the gig knowing that, you know, <laughs> and Julie knows us well enough and knows her husband yeah. well enough that she sure. doesn't have to, she doesn't have to play games. She says, you know, and Paul said, well, you know, Julie's not really into our kind of music, which I know is laughing about. Yeah. And I said to Julie, I said, you're not coming to hear our music. And she looked at me and said, there are no words. <laughs> and In other words, said, bing, bing. So we, 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 we were doing this song, but, you know, it had no title yet. And I looked at Paul later at the gig and I said, wow, that, that's perfect. <laughs> That's, that's it you know I, so so you know so i thank julie for for this wonderful wonderful insight into our music <laughs> uh listen i it's a great album so i i work in a premium fine wine and, and spirits retail store and mm -hmm. i am the architect of what music is played in the store nine times out of ten and oh, i put cool. a lot of jazz yeah. on various forms of jazz some traditional some hard bop Mm -hmm. And I've put this on, and a lot of times I'll get people asking, what the hell is this? Who the, who the hell is this playing? And, you know, it... it well, cool. It, hey, listen, we're, 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 trying to do, we're trying to do the work out here, you know, because, you know, who, how many people are going to be exposed to this if we, don't, if we don't play it? So, you know, so... And, you know, you know this, is what, this is what we have to do. So I look, at the, I look at the credits, and I have to, again, point out another Baltimore reference, and that is Steve Park, who did mm -hmm. a lot of the artwork and direction... Yep. Uh, for not just uh, LP music, but you know your work with uh, 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 F Deluxe. Yeah, I did do. Well, I mean, he he was he was you know Prince's guy for yep yep many many years. Yep. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But I have to point out Baltimore, and I will point out being the <laughs> that Mary Lou Badeau who oh. did the picture. Yeah. Of Easter Island picture yeah, here, Easter who Island. was the head yep. of Black Music at, division at Warner Brothers, and if I'm not yep. mistaken, you did the forward to her yep. book. I, I was so um, honored and complimented when she asked me to do because yep. all of the people that she has been, you know, known in her career oh that she God. asked me to yes. do the forward, I, I was I was very very touched by that. Yeah, that she's got a lot. That's a that's a she's, cool picture to have included in there. Um, I, I love the I love the picture. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I think it's I think it's great. Yeah, and and she 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 is she is a wonderful wonderful photographer. I, I mean that. she yeah. she takes you know pictures. She's done books of just her photography and a lot of stuff online. I'll have to check um, it out. And sent me oh. a lot a lot of things. And I just had that picture. And when it was time to do the cover, I just said, "Boy, that picture of <laughs> of Easter Island. We got I got to get that on here." Well, so. it kind of looks like the two of you. I mean, if you look at the cover of the two of you in a silhouette here, and you look at the two here, it kind of, you know, ah. 
I, I didn't even my... think that, that's a new insight. Thank you. That's... Well, there you go. Hey, you're okay. Listen, this is, but you see, this is the beautiful thing about art and it's subjective. And when somebody like me sees that, I said, well, it looks like the two of you yeah. kind of, you know, a, a, you know, as though the music's trying to be a, like a, t like the Easter Island statues has a timeless quality to it, maybe in, See, this is, I'm going to be your PR agent. Before you could, yeah, absolutely. I, I, should, I should be writing this down. It said, yeah, Kurt, Hoff, Kurt Hoffman says. Oh, my God. Listen, from your lips, man, that would, that, let me tell you, that's, thank you. But um, it's a great, it's a great uh, album. I, I, you know, the titles here, Madison Park. I'm sure there's a story behind that. No words. 15 minutes of shame. I mean, that, that's considering Paul's when title. it was written. Yeah, that's Paul's title. Yeah. Uh, aren't we us? Pyramid yeah. scheme. I love pyramid scheme. I just think of the '90s when I th '80s and '90s when I think of pyramid scheme. Div oh, the next track. I just a little sliver of uh, divide. You know that. Yeah. Again on the flute this time. Everybody's like, "Where's the saxophone? Where's that?" You're a woodwind player. I also played the uh, melodica on it. Oh, you okay? So that was you playing on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, good. You answered a question for me. Again, fretless bass. Mm about that little okay here's where my what is that choral sound and the, the left speaker um i don't know what it's called it's just a, a sound that paul found it's like a, yeah. it's in the, it's in the yeah. key of whatever you guys were doing okay i thought yeah. maybe it might be a choral sample of something but it, it um it, it probably is it's it's you know you, you um paul you know we we Recorded on Pro Tools, of course, which everybody does. But Paul has in his Pro Tools set up so many Banks um, right sounds and samples of it. And it's basically, we just, you know, he you might have something in mind. Sometimes it's like you might have something in mind and it said, like, oh, I know what I want. I have to find it. Or sometimes it's just, I have an idea for something, but I don't really know what I want yet. So let's just look and see. And all of a sudden, yeah. something will pop out. So, aha. Yeah. Eureka, that's it. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, those are the two tracks I wanted to highlight. I mean, the, the rest of the album's great. Quest Love's on one of the tracks on yep. drums. Yeah, we got Mike Stern playing guitar and a couple things too. Yeah. Which you don't have slackers on this. And Ricky Peterson, Paul's brother, of course, the keyboard yeah. is for so many different acts. Absolutely. In San, I think Stevie Nicks was uh, one yeah, point. Yeah, uh, recently out with Stevie Nicks. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Go out and get this digital copy. It'll be distributed through eBay. Yeah, that's. And uh, you go on eBay and you can it. look up Eric Leeds, Paul Peterson, No Words, LP Music. However, you get this. Yeah, and if you go to leedspeterson.com, um, on... we have the links right there, so you can you know just click and it'll take you right to the eBay link for it. Oh, it's it. So it really, really wonderful uh, stuff. And thank you for and 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 for what it, what it's worth. Um, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. So if you buy the CD, whether you buy the autograph version or the not autograph version, you can rest assured that I very carefully myself put it in an envelope and take it to the post office because we're 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 the you know the quintessential mom and pop organization here well, or the pop and pop organization. Listen uh, to tie into one of your uh, uh, music. Uh, uh, Folks that you that you have been, been had the privilege of of performing with over the years, Miss Sheila Escovedo. Oh yeah. When I just yeah. saw her recently uh, at the City Winery in Philly back in early February, mm -hmm. and that's where I initially had contacted you asking if you were going to be a part of this right, incarnation yeah. of the E Train, and you said unfortunately yeah. you weren't going to be part of yeah. it. Just how yeah. this whole ball got rolling, and uh, she was selling her new album. I'll pl what the hell plug it? Hella funky. Mm -hmm. And she was selling the di direct from her, you know, and her, I believe her cousins or relatives were in the merch booths 
working and selling directly the, the, yeah. the CDs for that because yeah. she didn't want to put it on streaming initially because mm -hmm. you don't get all the money. I mean, with streaming no, again, know. you know, and it's a hard road to hoe, but it, yeah. it's, you know, it's important that the, you know, why tickets are so expensive for artists these days, you know, I'm going to see Peter Gabriel and that, you know, one of my favorite artists in that world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tony Levin alone, <laughs> bass player. Oh, you know, yeah. One yeah. of my, one of my, uh, in that genre, one of my favorites, um, you know, tickets were no less than 200 bucks because nobody, you know, you can't afford with, with the, with the music not being purchased in the traditional way anymore. Yet. I, I yeah. hope it gets resolved. The, the other aspect too of tickets being is because there are so many people that have their hands in it. When you look at just, yeah. well, I mean, you, you saw the, you know, all the, that what's in the news recently about the Taylor Swift yeah. thing and, yeah. and with the uh, live nation ticket master yeah. by yeah. the time, you know, it's like if an artist comes to them and says, I would like to try to keep tickets reasonable. It's not even up to the artist half of the time now, right. but by the time, you know, because the monopolization of the venues alone right. is that if you want to have a tour, this is where you're going to have to play. And guess what? We run it. So we're going to charge, <laughs> we're going to charge what we charge, right. you know, if you either want a piece of it or not, but guess what? So it, it's, it's crazy. It's nuts. Oh my, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I tell you, I, I think at this point, talking about trains or baseball, be a better yeah, subject. <laughs> Yeah. The business of music versus the music itself, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. all right. So I'm going to throw another little one at you. I know we're going to get to your other solo albums that you have here, but this, this little thing here uh, from KTEL records. Oh uh, yeah. Is... Yeah. Wow. You know, I don't even have a copy of that. I got I it off think... eBay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Want to borrow yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I, well, I, I have to. I have to. There you did with Doctor Fink with Matt. Yeah. Well, and... he he produ he was the producer of the, of the of the album. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, I have here. Remember very very little about it. Okay. And I don't know well, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But... Uh, you did so the actual album. So Doctor Feelgood. In a Blue Mood was the name of the album. This is a compilation. I don't want nobody Always Can you hear that? Yep. Okay. Who's the singer? I don't even remember who the singer is. Okay. I was wondering... Uh, uh, I, ha I have to go back and look at my notes here. It is Debbie Duncan. Oh, it's Debbie. Okay. Sure. I knew nothing about Jimmy McGriff, so you're gonna. Well, Jimmy McGriff was one of the, um, you know, one of the, one of the iconic jazz organ players. I mean, uh, you know, from from back in the day, uh, Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, Jack McDuff, Charlie Erland, um, Groove Holmes. These, you, you know, these were the yeah. some of the great, you know. But Jimmy McGriff was he he was yeah he was huge for all years. Right, so when I go back when I go back and listen to this episode, I'm writing all those names down because you give. You, you get it, every i am i'm surprised you never took a history of jazz professors professorial gig i don't know that you'd ever want to do that but you you give a lesson every time i've heard you in an interview well you know if if i could if i could figure out a way to get paid for running my mouth like i do that might be something to look into so <laughs> <laughs> I, listen if you and your brother had a podcast either separately or together my my nephew has always been bugging both Alan and I to do a podcast, and we we have really um, considered it. It's just the, the the timing of it and whatever, but but it's it. something that I think we, I would like to think eventually we will do. Yeah. No. Uh, please, because I'm telling you, you are dropping knowledge bombs, whether you think you are or not, because you, these people you've either grown up listening to or have actually personally worked with. You know, to to the rest of us that uh, may not necessarily have the, I mean, I'm a classically trained opera singer, mm -hmm. and I'm involved in other different circles, and I'm just really starting to full 
fully embrace the jazz world. I have for a while, but I don't know these things like you do. And it's, I always learn something new. Speaking like, of more, you know, symphonic classical music, when we lived in Pittsburgh, my, my, one of my dad's um, extracurricular activities, he was a financial director, treasurer for a while of the Pittsburgh Symphony. Oh, wow. Yeah. From this is the late, late sixties, early seventies, you know, very yeah. cool. Very yeah. cool. Had you yeah. ever gone to see any, um, I don't know, are you, are you into any of the classical music at all? Or? I, over the years, have become more um, interested in symphonic music. I must regret that I never really had the interest in it that I probably should have had to the degree, you know, when I was younger. Occasionally, I would go, you know, to hear, hear a concert now and then. Um, I'm probably more inclined to enjoy, it's just funny when I talk about uh, the more modern composers like Stravinsky. We're talking about music sure. that's already 125 years oh, old. Yeah, but Stravinsky's modern, but, brilliant. Yeah, um, Debussy, Bartok, uh, Ravel. Oh, Ravel. You know, uh, um, composers like that. Um, when Debussy? I was in, when I would, yes, very much so. Um, Dvorak. Sure. Um, when I was in music school, of course at Duquesne, we used to have the um, every semester the listening test. Ooh, you know, the beginning drop, the rep, the, drop the needle, baby. Drop the needle, and so I listened. You know, and and I all I would always did very well with them. Um, but I, I must say, actually, my my father loved symphonic music and and, and had show a tunes, huge huge too. yeah show tunes and a lot of jazz too. Um, when he passed away, he left both, you know, to me and my brother, like several hundred albums and CDs, mostly of classical stuff. And I have gone through a lot of them to just try to seek out, you know, things that might be of interest. I must uh, unfortunately say that going back to the music, particularly Beethoven or Brahms or, or Mozart, there's probably very little of that music that really resonates with me. me. Okay. Um, harmonically and, and, and everything. And, and um, I, I have listened um, several times to, you know, for example, to all of Beethoven's symphonies. Yeah. Um, the one that I probably remember as probably, you know, thinking, well, this is something that I, I would actually maybe go out of my way to want to listen to occasionally would, would, was this the third, the, the er Eroica. Eroica. Okay, yeah. sure. Um, but um, there are things of Stravinsky that I just absolutely, I absolutely love. Petrushka. Oh, sure. You know, yep. but it's, you know, harmonically and even rhythmically, to, you know, to the extent that we, we consider rhythmic aspects of, of, of symphonic music, which obviously it has, but we don't, you know, don't really think of. of but you know, Stravinsky but, but, wrote for Woody Herman, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so you know, uh, the Ebony Concerto. So, okay. you know, I, I can I, see why I'm not familiar with that. I should look for that one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I can give you a couple of recommendations. On and, recording. you know, several other um, um, more obscure composers that I can't even remember the names of, but there was a bunch of CDs that I listened to and put aside and said, okay, I'm going to keep these and I'm going to get into these someday because there's something about this is, you know, so. Well, a know, jazz they, head like yourself, I can see where you would like somebody like Ravel or Debussy because their harmonies, particularly yep. now we're going to get real for, for some people who don't necessarily know the music theory, that the whole tone scale appeals very much in the jazz idiom. Sure. You know, I mean, let's, let us not forget that uh, later down the road, Quincy Jones studied at Paris conservatory with Nadia Boulanger, who would have yes. known all of yep. that music. Well, and there, there, there was, yeah. you know, growing up with, with the jazz that I listened to when, you know, when we think of the, the pioneers of, of bebop and, and post-bop, Bud Powell, Thelonious Monk, um, John Lewis, uh, Lenny Tristano, uh, Tad Dameron, people like that. Yeah. But when you start, and Witten Kelly, who is one of my absolute favorite, Oscar Peterson, of course, when you start to get into the next generation of, of pianists, who really, aside from like Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter, yeah. the primary uh, developers of, of, of the evolution of jazz in the 60s were almost primarily the pianists, which makes sense because they're dealing with 
the harmony, the mm -hmm. instruments they play. But when you look at probably the most significant pianist that came up in the music, mm -hmm. starting with Bill Evans, mm -hmm. Herbie Hancock, yeah. oh. Chick Corea, mm -hmm. McCoy Steiner, Joe Zavadul, Keith Jarrett. All of those players, with the exception, I'm not sure as much about McCoy, but Herbie, Chick, Keith, Zavendel, mm. they're all extremely accomplished classical pianists also. Okay, so can I interrupt you for just a second? Sure. To tie into what you just said, the one and only time I saw Chick Corea perform was at Wolf Trap in Vienna, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Bobby McFerrin was the conductor. Mm -hmm. They did Prokofiev's classical symphony, if I'm not mistaken, Mozart's of Vera Madigan. Prokofiev is another composer that a lot of stuff I like. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, notice we're not talking a lot about Prince. I'm sure this is like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I love Prince's music. Don't get me wrong. I grew Absolutely. up listening yeah. to you playing for him. So, you know, that was my gateway into all this other stuff that you, you know. So, but. Uh, where was I? So listening to that type of music and, and the backgrounds and the different uh, things, and, and I just double checked for you. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry, because, yep. you know, I'm like a gumball machine, but sometimes I like, I, I'm hoping <laughs> the right okay. thing comes out. So, but, but the, the, the Stravinsky uh, piece is the Ebony Concerto. So you need mm -hmm. to check that out. And yep. Woody Herman, there's a recording that he did with Woody Herman. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, the Copeland uh, 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 clarinet concerto with uh, Benny Goodman. Yep, yep, yeah. Oh. But there, there's so much of the harmony that started yes. to seep into um, jazz, particularly in, yes. in, in the 60s. Yes. That is definitely coming out of, of the, har the harmonic vocabulary that, yep. that those musicians had. That was as much of a, a part of yep. their, their classical. Yep. You know, that we're moving beyond just rhythm. I got rhythm changes, um, Cole Porter, you know, the, oh, the great sure. American songbook and moving oh, into um, more static harmony, more modal harmony, more, you know, and things that Coltrane was into, all of that. Yes, he um, was. That had, you know, his, his famous melody to his famous song called Impressions. The melody comes from a classical piece. Yeah, I believe I'm, not, I'm trying to think. I think it comes from something that was written by Hindemith. You know, Ooh, Death and yeah. Transfiguration, Hindemith. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you know, so there's all that. I mean, Joe Zavinol, Weather Report. There was so much. I mean, Weather Report was just an electronic symphony orchestra. I mean, that's basically what it was. Oh, you he know. pushed the back. And let's not forget Herbie Hancock devised Herbie. a pre MIDI. Uh, keyboard a device that hooked up to a personal computer long before MIDI was even on the uh uh that's right yeah right so you know yeah. you got these guys who not only broke the, the the boundaries of taking this language that was known primarily in in classical such a mislabel you know i i, 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 know. And I don't want to say yeah. serious music but orchestrally composed music yes better way to put you know, it yeah. i i consider james brown just to be as orchestral as any Absolutely. of that shit because you know three Absolutely. drummers that's not just a, there, that's not just a five no. piece kit that's a percussion section you know he's James Brown from... James Brown was one of the greatest musical architects Absolutely of anybody yep and to that extent you know there 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 are certain musicians in any genre yep. that if you have an opportunity to be associated with them or, or if you're looking into their music. Yeah. Um, I don't care what genre, I, I, can, I, can put it, I can put it this way. In almost every musical situation that I have ever found myself in, with, in all of my recordings or whatever, somewhere in the back of my mind, whether it's a song like No Words or anything that I'm doing, there can be some, something that says to me, what would James Brown do with this? Wow. That says a lot. And that's a benchmark. Now, I could say the same thing. I could say, well, what would Miles Davis do with this? Well, Ray Charles. But more than anybody, James Brown, for whatever reason, there is a certain standard of just musical architecture that, to me, was, was the most astounding thing about James Brown to me. 
And we're adding another chapter, ladies and gentlemen, to the gospel according to Eric Leeds. And honestly, that should be your title of your book. I'm just saying. I honestly, I really such I'll a tell cool... you when you t- when you talk about those three drummers, um, Jabo Starks, Clyde John Starks, Jabo, Clyde Stubblefield, and well, you, you know, the third drummer sometimes was whoever. You know, there was a point in time where, in, for a brief period in 1960 time, 69, or it was Jabo, Clyde, and Mel Parker, no, Maceo's okay. brother. Yes. And I mean that that's like seeing a jazz band with like Tony Williams, Jack DeJohnette and Elvin Jones playing in the same band. I mean, you know, um, there were certain songs at certain parts of James Brown's show where all three drummers would be playing together. And there, there was an arrangement that James had in the, in, in the mid sixties of, of the famous Lieber Stoller song, Kansas City. Yes. I mean, probably the most covered song that they ever wrote. Yep. James Brown had an absolutely fabulous arrangement of that song that they would do mm-hmm. and Jabo was the primary drummer because it was that shuffle it was yeah. that bunk, 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 bunk shuffle groove that J- that Jabo just owned yeah but there was a point in time so through the first several minutes of the song he was the primary drummer and then the sh- then it would go into the out vamp where James was now done singing and he was dancing he was doing his choreography yeah. or whatever and just tearing it up. And by then the crowd is just going nuts. And there was a point in time where they hit the out vamp and the other two drummers would then kick in. Mm. And for the last minute and a half of the song, you've got three drummers and they're, they're choreographing fills together. And they're all hitting, you know, on the two with three kick drums and six cymbals crashing on the two in tandem. And I remember as a 14 or 15 year old kid standing <laughs> backstage yeah. at, con- at gigs, yeah. being able to be about 10 or 15 feet from the row of those three drummers <sighs> and standing there and feeling the floor shake. <laughs> and I think that's where I tell people where I, I finally completely and utterly lost my musical virginity <laughs> because it was basically like I'm a saxophone player. Right. You know, I'm not, a, I don't aspire to be a singer or a dancer. Yeah. I'm primarily going to, you know, maybe making instrumental music, jazz or whatever. But it was basically, it was like everything that I attempt to do better make me feel like I feel right now. Wow. Regardless of whether it's an up song, a ballad, whatever, yeah. I have to feel or try to think that I can feel what I feel now. Yeah. from what i'm hearing sure. and that was it that, that that's my my fatal glass of beer is it is, is the old I, I, I tell you what a hell of a way to break your cherry uh, in yeah, musical really. sense man i yeah. mean but your description of it is why you need to do a podcast or a book or something because man i tell you it, it's just uh, you know leads lines <laughs> <laughs> whatever the hell you want to call it because and then not just a saxophone line but this is why it's important i mean I, the, you the, know. the problem became years later not the problem but the circumstance years later was that um because that was my template was maybe why i could not get but so excited even at the peak of the experiences i had with prince not that they didn't mean a lot to me, right? But I, it was impossible for me to not almost intrinsically or, or automatically compare whatever we were doing to those kinds of experiences. And sometimes Prince, I would have to kind of watch myself because Prince would be get really excited as as he should, right? When we would be doing something that was really cool. And really yeah. just kicking it. Yeah. And Prince was somebody that liked to share his enthusiasm with everybody in the band, which right. we were all very appreciative of. And, sure. and you should as a band sure. leader. And I remember one point in time we came off the stage after a gig and it was a, a tremendous, it was a really, really great gig. And we yeah. killed, you yeah. know, band was killing. Yeah. And Prince was excited. He was going and I didn't even think about it. I just kind of said, you said, yeah, Prince, we were kicking tonight. Boy, I tell you what, 
it almost reminded me of that night back and I had to stop myself and say, oh, no, no, no. I don't don't need fall to down there. that rabbit hole. right? Yeah, because right. Prince is now looking at me like, what? <laughs> and I said, no, Prince was great. Oh, we killed, you know, I mean, and I'm saying, you know, I said, yeah, because we did, but it was like, every, <laughs> but I'm sorry, you know, when I was 15 years old or whatever, and I'm, I got the opportunity and, and, and when that gig with James Brown was over, I'm in the dressing room with James Brown afterwards, sitting, kicking it with James Brown, you know, as a teenager, I yeah. mean, how, sense yeah. memory being what it is. I mean, that sense memory overload at, of the highest order. I think yeah. anybody that later learns about, I think even Prince himself, and of course this is speculation because he's no longer with us. I think he understood. I think he would have understood event eventually. Yeah, no, maybe I, not, I, maybe I, not at I, the time you worked with him, but maybe if he had lived a little longer, or even about the time you worked with him on One Night Alone, uh, for the One Night hmm. Alone tour, he probably yeah. would have like, yeah, man, because you know, at that time he's working with the original sources of James. Well, with, with that, that, by then he had, you know, it was it was funny because um, Prince and I had gone our separate ways around 1996, and there was right. like a six seven year period where. Right. You know, we didn't see each other, no reason to. And then one night I was playing um, here in Minneapolis from around 1998, 99 for off and on for almost 10 years. I played with a tremendous Latin jazz band led by a singer percussionist, Esther Godinez. Um, mm. And we actually have an album out um, that, we, that we recorded. It. Um, mm. Oh, I, I should find it. I, I don't have a copy of it with me right now um we'll and Esther, touch, Esther wanna... actually did a couple things with Prince too I think but anyway yeah. we were playing here in 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 Minneapolis and Prince came to the gig one night and, I, and and we hadn't seen each other about six seven years wow and that was the year that um Maceo Parker had joined James's band sure James obviously Maceo a mentor of mine I knew Maceo since I was a kid um and <laughs> i <laughs> So, so we're, we're, you know, we're kicking. I said, Prince, how you doing? It's been a long time. How you been? Whatever. And I, I said to him, I said, I laughed. And I said, Prince, I see you finally hired the saxophone player. You probably should have hired from day one. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's get to the chase. Let's cut to the chase here. You know, and I just laughed. I said, you finally got the only guy you have, you know, you got the guy. Yeah. So, you know. And that's yeah. humble of you to say that, but as well as you know how controlling Prince was, I always thought he had a Napoleonic, you know, component. He did. He did. And and you're supposed to. That's what band leaders like that should have. <laughs> yeah. Again, true. Yeah. I uh, mean, you think Miles Davis didn't? I mean, oh God, you know, it don't... manifests itself in, a diff in different ways, sure. you know. So anyway. But yeah. no, but it, at that age and station that you worked with him, I don't know that he would have appreciated you telling the story about James because he would have seen it as a threat. Oh, absolutely. And that you're there, not there was a that. part of him that would have seen it as a threat. Another part of him would have said, yeah, but I don't want to have to admit that I get it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But again, if you, if your loyalty came into question, you know, because it seems to me, and I, you can answer this better than anybody, that loyalty meant more than money to him than anything. If you were yeah. loyal to and, his and, vision. And, and, and it should, because the basic yeah. thing was, is my job. To perform? To per my his my job. You know, here's the thing. We're talking earlier about my being on the road bar band with Billy Price. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we're on the road with Billy Price, there's seven of us in a Dodge van driving 200, 300 <laughs> miles to the next gig you know, staying in, in, in a motel that we hope, um, you, you know, the roaches aren't too bad. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, the certain yep. circumstances like that. Yep. And we, and at the end of the week, um, I have the wonderful result to be able to have come back with maybe 200 or $250 in my pocket from that for yep. a week. Several years later now, I'm going around the world with Prince the job is exactly the same. Yep. I go to the gig, I get my horn out of its case. Yep. I go on stage, whatever the venue is, 
And my job is to play the music the way the band leader expects the music to be realized. And my job is to do whatever I am able to do in service of this guy's music. So the task is absolutely no different. So what do you need from me? Right. And, And to the extent that I'm able to do that, then I have a gig the next day. (laughs) Again, that pragmatism has carried you, had carried you through the decades. I mean, the assignment's the same, the the, the band leader's different, but the assignment at the core of it all remains the same. Yeah, the most important aspect of Prince's, of playing with Prince was very um, practical. He was hugely popular which meant that he had the resources to be able to pay me more money than <laughs> now, not just I was in it for the, you know, but I mean, Hey, it was a gig. You know, there's a part of it. Like I said, this is nice. I'm finally, you know, I finally get to put a little bit more money in my pocket. And it wasn't just that I'm there just for the money. I'm enjoying the gig, but it was like, Hey, you know, um, I could have enjoyed musically playing with Prince to the same extent if all Prince was, was a bar band musician. Yeah. But the fact that he's usually popular enables him to put a bunch more money in my pocket. That's, that's not something that I'm going to, to, um, you know, take for granted either. No. And, so like, and nor did yeah. you, I mean, yeah. we could go on about, you know, the flesh sessions, the countless number of input, you know, you said in many interviews that you did about 175 songs and maybe five ten percent of that's only ever been released with you on it yeah something like that probably. something yeah. like that yeah. and um i mean we could go through i i want to take a different little turn here for a second sure. you know i'm asking you as many flute questions as i've as you notice that i i'm particularly interested because who the hell decided i guess obviously it was prince when you guys did get off when you mm-hmm. played the flute mm-hmm. on that, mm-hmm. who the hell? I mean, it's genius because you know hip hop. You didn't really hear flute being used at that time in '91. You know all these different hip hop songs mm-hmm. coming out. I'll think I'll digital underground. I'll throw out an, a hip hop thing. Uh, De La Soul. They were using samples of jazz records, <laughs> like mm-hmm. especially De La Soul. But um, the fact that he incorporated hip hop into his vernacular later on, but decided. I'm going to have Eric play a flute on the melody, that, that, that tag, that, that leads line kind of. Da, 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 da. Yeah. No, that was, that was entirely, that was his. Yeah. But why the flute? Why not the saxophone? Um, I mean, that's I have no idea. I have, I have no idea. You know, you, you know, that there, there's, there's, some, you know, it's easy to want to romanticize. The I'm not romanticizing. Process, no, I, I, I know. I know the, yeah. The process of, um, <laughs> Why the fuck when I would call, be called into the studio now by then when he did that I was no longer a member of his working band right so it was just basically uh, I would get a call over now and then to you know do session right. I'm trying to remember whether he was there for that session I think he was okay um because by then I would get called to do sessions and he wasn't even there Okay. You know, he you would just like, like a whole. You did like a whole flute instrumental thing, and I and you know, I, I guess maybe he just had that manipulated. You just recorded a bunch of tracks, and yeah, they, and I think he he's he, by then he was starting to to sample a lot of stuff. Yeah. So I might you know put put the put the basic thing on, and then he would sample it and, and manipulate it how he chose for you know different versions. But I, uh, but you know, basically it was like I get called for a session, I bring all my horns just so I've got everything there. Sure. Um, Just in which, case he decided which, at the last minute. Yeah, which worked out for me because you know, as, as you know, the way union rules work, that every every added instrument that I play, <laughs> that's a double. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so on 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 that, that was ba- you know that was definitely his decision that he he heard flute on that. So. I mean, hey Prince, did you want me to put a melodica on there too? I'll do that hey, for you. If you- <laughs> no. L- Trust me, I, I was, you know, I had all my instruments because it was like, sure. if he saw all my instruments there, then a lot of times just his curiosity was, well, let me hear what, what, what the baritone would sound like on that. 
And even if it wasn't used, I got paid. You know, extra, you know so I mean, you, you know, understand something. Romanticism aside, this, this is still how I earned a living. So excuse me, I'm, I'm taking advantage of everything, every opportunity. You know, you, you, so. you're a jazz musician working with a rock and roll budget, yeah. much like you would for you, as you've said. This is yeah. uh, quoting you yeah. for when you did your well. Times Squared really, technically, is not your really your first solo album. If we keep yeah, it. It, that's it's kind of a hybrid because hybrid. that was done under the guise of that was still going to be um, a Madhouse album. Yeah, it was ostensibly still, you know, planning planned to be a third Madhouse album. It's still good shit though. I mean, you know, what you were the, the the fact that you were given this liberty and license to do with tracks. I mean, you've said this in several sorts. So I guess we're going back into familiar territory. Eventually, we were going to have you know all yeah, roads were yeah. going to lead to this. But um, but, but but to your to your point, if if Prince had come to me initially and said, uh, "I want to sign you yourself to a contract, make an album." Yeah. That wouldn't have been the album, you know. It would have been my next album, which was Things Left Unsaid. Oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, this one. Yeah. Oh, uh, that yeah. one. Yeah. And let me and and again, let me throw out another Baltimore reference. Gil Goldstein, born in Baltimore, Maryland. Well, see, yeah, you know, okay, interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was a pr producer on that on that album. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yep. yep. And a hell of a yep. keyboardist and multi instrumentalist. Oh, absolutely. No, there, see, there, um, there's so much about that album that was specifically about, about you know the resources and and shh. and what he was able to bring to it which, which was the whole point yeah. you know yeah 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 oh i i uh just gonna give a sliver of of both i'm gonna skip this one all right this this one right here overnight every night the familiar line mm. So many Prince fans will know that he even used that in One Night Alone, if I'm not mistaken, on his live album. We're about to it get is. deep okay. in here tonight, folks. You know, and uh... I've got I've got an interesting thing to, to talk about about that album when um, yeah when I was doing it because ostensibly because it was going to be a third Madhouse album. Yeah. Um, the difference this time was is that Prince was really busy. He had just gotten the um, offer to do the Batman album, the stuff for the Batman movie. And he yeah. needed to get it done quick because the movie was already ready, you know. To go. So yeah. he, he was under a, a tight deadline. So he basically threw the Madhouse project at me and said, you have to run with this one, but here's where you can start, which gave me finally the opportunity to say, okay, so I can kind of run with this in a different way, which is what led him up to to eventually deciding to release it under my name because it then became something that he right. said, I love it, but it now doesn't sound as much like Madhouse to me. Fine, cool. But when when I was in the midst of, of recording stuff for that album, there are two songs on that album, one, one, one of which is called Andorra, and the other one yep. was called Once Upon a Time. Mm -hmm. And I needed piano on those. Mm -hmm. And since it was still... Uh, ostensibly a madhouse project i went to prince and said and and the song andorra i had completely rearranged and recut and done a whole bunch of things and there was an initial piano solo that prince had put on from the initial jam session yeah. that that song came from but i had taken the song in a different way and had recut and edited it and basically had to wipe his solo because it wasn't going to work anymore yeah, yeah but i yeah. still needed a new piano solo Okay. So I went to Prince and I said, look, I need you to come in and redo the piano solo on this song. And then I want you to add some <laughs> piano to this other song that wow. didn't have piano on it. And he said to me, he said, he listened to what I was doing. And he said, Eric, I can come in and do whatever I can do. And I'm sure, you know, but I said, what you're doing with this music, you need to call Ricky Peterson. I, okay. Right. Okay. You know, and, and I knew Ricky, but I had never worked with Ricky yet. And I certainly knew his reputation. He was working with David Sanborn, and you know, but I never had the opportunity to actually uh, work with Ricky yet. Yeah, yeah, so I said, no, I said, really? He said, no, absolutely. He said, I can give you something that can work. But I said, 
what you really need is something. And basically what Prince was telling me was, I can't give you what this music demands. And for and and that's how many people did he ever say an, that to? That's an that's the that's the that's an artist. Right. That is a musical artist who can at that point detach himself and say, Yeah, I can give you some stuff and maybe you'll dig it, maybe cool. But what I'm hearing, what you're going with this, and he's like, he's hearing things in the music that I'm not isn't even necessarily coming to terms with yet. Right. And he laughed and he said, get Ricky Peterson. And he laughed and he said, you can thank me in the morning. Oh man. I called Ricky. Ricky came in and within five minutes, I realized Jesus. perfect. Wow. Ricky just nailed it. And, and all of the vocabulary of the Herbie Hancocks or, you know, the, the chicory is the, you know, all of that, that, that this music was now demanding yeah. was what Ricky could bring. That is not what, Prince has in his, wow. you know, his, his toolbox. And Prince is the one telling me, this is what this music needs. And it's not me. That's Paul that, and, and, yeah. and that's not just, and he wasn't being humble. He was just nope. being pragmatic. Like being pragmatic. He had one of those brains that, you know, my yeah. gosh, you know, it, it, he wasn't being humble. He's just being real with you. Like, no, you yeah. need this person. And he could hear it in his head before anybody else did. Yeah, that's incredible. Now let me ask yeah. something about that. Out, so the, the the Times Squared album, did you yourself cut the tape by hand, or did you have the? Ed, was it Michael Koppelman, the uh, engineer um, on that one? There, there were a variety of of engineers. Michael right. Koppelman was one. I think most of the actual hand editing on the stuff was done by a guy named um, David Friedlander. Friedlander, okay. Yeah, I, th I think he was he was. The guy that ended but you up. yourself weren't there with the razor blade and the uh oh no i i don't no no <laughs> no no <Okay. laughs> no no that that that's why paisley park pays pays for engineer <laughs> pays for engineers okay. my well, my job my job ends as soon as the, as soon as the noise comes out of the bell of the horn <laughs> <laughs> their their job begins getting it on tape and cutting it up and doing all that yeah now obviously i'm the one telling them you know cut here you know i i but you know, but, but the razors in, in their hands. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, you know, I know <laughs> Prince. Uh, well, there's stories that, that that Prince did cut his own tape, but that uh, I don't think so. Okay. I, yeah. there I, were, I doubt. I doubt that. I think there was a little romanticization going yeah, on there because I, Susan Rogers says, "No way, he cut tape. I cut no, the damn." No. Yeah. Right. No. Right. If, okay. if 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 something went wrong with if there was anything wrong with the machine. Prince was hands off and was Susan, Susan, I need help. <laughs> right, got it. Okay, yeah. but by the time you got to do your own album, and and you are probably less than a handful of people, or maybe a handful of people that had creative control over product on a Prince-related thing like nobody else. And you, I know you've spoken a lot, espoused that a lot in interviews, but. Uh, personally, I, I I know the Prince fans like the um, Times Square album because there's a lot of princisms on. Yeah, it because and... it's it's still it's still basically it's me messing around with Prince tracks, and, and it's great. Uh, yeah. But however, uh, yeah. uh, the uh, the uh, time, things left on things left, things unsaid, left unsaid is is my truly truly yeah. your first solo album at that. Point. Yeah, that really is one where yeah, yeah. and. Um, when it came time for Prince to make a decision as to whether to pick up the option on the contract to allow me to do a second album. And I sat down with him and Prince had a lot of different ideas about, about you know, what he thought I should do. Yep. None of which was much of what I was interested in doing. Right. Um, and we used to laugh about that. And, you know, he was, he would always talk about, Eric, you should be a showman, you know, the way you play and everything. I, I see you jumping off pianos. And I just laughed and I said to Prince, I said, well, Prince, you keep that thought in your head because that's that's about as far as that's going to go. <laughs> and we would laugh about that. And Prince looked at me and he said, Eric, you're so hardcore. And I said, Prince, I don't, I don't characterize my perspective as being hardcore. I just know what I want to do. And I know how I want to go about doing that. Right. right. And he said to me, he says, well, do you really know what you want to do with the second album? And he said, I got a stack of music of my own, but 
At this point in time, what I should do is go to the A&R department at Jazz at Warner Brothers right. and get them involved because unless we get them involved from ground up, they're not going to have a sense of ownership in the album. And right. it's just, you know. And Prince looked at me and he says, you want to get the suits involved? Yeah. And I said, Prince, let me ask you something. Do I, you know, do you have my back? And he said, well, what does that mean? I said, when a push comes to shove, if I can take advantage of what they can bring to a project to enhance and give me a platform to do what I think I can do, yeah. but I really don't know until I get into it, but they can provide me with the opportunities with finding a really good producer because I want a producer yeah. other than myself on this right. one. Right. I want to be able to surround myself with musicians that they have the relationships that they can bring into right. the project. But at <laughs> point in time, when it comes to making the final decision as to what actually happens, yeah, you know, do you have my back? Mm. And he said, yes. Mm. And I said, thank you very much. And for him to have said that to me and basically said, Eric, now get the hell out of here and go make some music. Mm. There is nothing that I can think of that I could be more grateful for. Yep. Not only just coming from somebody of the caliber of musician that he was, yep. but also the fact that he had the resources in a record company to allow me to do it. Now, I have to say that years later, when I did my album Now and Again, it was Bobby Z, Bobby Rifkin, who came to me, who was the executive producer for that album. That I did not know. I, I yeah. have a digital copy of that. I'm waiting for my physical yeah. copy of that. Okay. Album. But for Prince to have yeah. given me the opportunity and basically I walked out of that, of, of his apartment, his office, went into Alan's office because Alan at that point was running, was the head of Paisley Park Records yeah. and said, you know, we got the go ahead. And the next thing we did is we started a relationship mm -hmm. with the in our department at Warner Brothers and, and they suggested Gil Goldstein, who I thought was a great idea. And all of the different musicians that were on that album, the fact that um, most of the album was, much of the album was done in New York. Yep. Um, and it was Prince providing me with that opportunity. And if there's anything that I, could be eternally and will always be grateful to him was was that you know that that's that's you know uh, uh, I, I can't say you know you really can't say enough about that no you can't what that one meant to me and the fact that like you say um he didn't hear anything of that album until it was completely done wow yeah Talk about later. trust. Well, and of course, he was slightly busy doing hundred. He was busy. Thousand. He was always busy. Yeah, and 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 you know, to be absolutely, you know, it's like, is he busy? Good, keep him busy. <laughs> so I can, you know, so. Understood. Yeah. Message yeah. received and understood, sir. Yeah. So yeah. can we listen to a little? So I had emailed you. I had taken a vacation to Puerto Rico, and man, am I going to go back? Whew. Yeah. Uh, and I actually played Aguadilla as I was entering Aguadilla. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, when I knew we were going to go to Puerto Rico for my husband's, uh, Aaron's uh, birthday, I said, okay, I'm playing, we're going to go to Aguadilla and Cabo Rojo. And if you've never mm -hmm. been, the Crash Boat Beach is one of the most fabulous beaches in all of Puerto Rico. Absolutely. We went to Arecibo. We saw, oh, I'm, I'm telling you, it just fabulous. Yeah. time there and the weather didn't suck either i mean you know kind of like what you're having today and we're having today yeah. <laughs> minus some nice blue beaches but um <laughs> so listening to this little bit and i asked you why you did the title and you gave me an answer and we're going to learn today boys and girls what a montuno is after <laughs> we listen to the introduction to this see i remembered i remembered okay.
a little bit of the uh song yeah, Aguadilla yeah. from Things Left Unsaid. Dude, that is that that line. You have these such singable melodies. Oh, in, thank in, you, man. In, in I, I appreciate lines. that. I mean, you know. Rick, Ricky Peterson on piano on that cut. Uh, listen. Yeah, that was Ricky. Yeah. Fantastic track. Just uh, the little yeah. offbeat, uh, you know, and the, the little and things that you have that he does on the keyboards in particular. Inter interestingly, I had actually done a different version of that song that might have gone on Times Square, but didn't Ooh. with Ricky playing. Oh. But there was no Montuno on it because I didn't, it was, it just kind of stayed where it was. And it was something that when it came time to do things left unsaid, mm -hmm. I played the original version for Gil Goldstein. Yeah. And he said, you know, it could use something additional to what you have. Okay. And, and he said, since you really, really love Afro-Cuban music and salsa, why don't you extend it and maybe put like some kind of a, a Latin thing to it. So I came up, took it back, and then the, where, where it goes into the Montuno in the second half, that was all new because the original title of the song, I called it Portofino. Okay. You know, okay. but now it had a Montuno and I said, well, I can't name it after, a, 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 you know, a, a town on the Italian Riviera. Yeah, I got to no. like, you know, so I said, okay. So I, I looked, I pulled out my atlas of Puerto Rico and I said, oh, I'll put deal like that. So, oh, Jesus. Okay. So, so Nim, you did tell me you went on a vacation with as kids with your brother and your parents. Yeah, we were out in Dorado Con Beach. Yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah. What beach again? Dorado. Dorado. Oh, Dorado. Not Condado, yeah. but Dorado. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but there was an artist that you uh, had referenced that from, I believe, from the Brooklyn area. Um, yeah, Ray, Ray Barreto. Ray Barreto, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right. Give me a little background about Ray Barreto, because I know you can't. Well, Ray, Ray Barreto was, um, he passed away years ago. He's he's one of the all-time iconic uh, Afro-Cuban Latin jazz percussion players, primarily mm -hmm. Tomador Conga, yeah. um, mm -hmm. tremendous band leader. I mean, some yeah. of the great, great bands through the 60s and 70s and the 80s or whatever, Ray Barreto. Right. And he also played on tons and tons of, of sessions. Sure. Um, and so, some of absolute favorite music in the world is, is, is from Ray Barreto and his bands. And then we could talk, and it, I find it interesting that you have a particular affinity to Afro-Cuban. I find many jazz musicians. So when I talked to Greg Boyer a year or so ago, he came on the podcast here. A lovely guy. I've actually, oh, Greg, I actually Greg worked, I've actually worked with him adjacently. I can tell yeah. you that story uh, off the air, but um, he, he 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 loved his favorite music is your favorite style of music the Afro Cuban stuff he lives in that world he says I, yeah. I actually like it more than funk if I'm not mistaken well here, here here's here's the thing if if you can look at it from a from a, a analytical standpoint yes the Montuno sometimes known as the Son Montuno S O N Montuno basically in English it's a vamp. It's okay. where the is where the piano or the violins or the guitar or the bass they get into a repetitive figure, yeah. Where basically the piano is playing the exact same figure over and over and over again, and the percussion, of course, is just keeping that groove going, which is basically the hallmark structurally of what funk is. It's basically you take a groove and you just pound it into the ground, yeah, and you keep that groove going. The repetitiveness. People that think, well, you're just repeating the same thing over and over. It becomes boring. Only if you do, if you do it right, it's not. You know, it's kind of like Woody Allen's, the, the line from the Woody Allen, I forget one said, Woody Allen says, somebody asked me, is, 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 is sex dirty? He said, it, only when you do it right. <laughs> right? It's the same thing say. with the funk. You know, if you're doing it right, it will not be boring because it is the repetitiveness that, that raises the tension that keeps that going. Well, Afro-Cuban music was funk before funk right. because this basic idea of the Son Montudo was developed in Cuba back in the 1930s, right. you know, and really blended from that. Now, the James Brown, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, and Thelonious Monk of Afro-Cuban music was Eddie Palmieri. It's yeah, still Eddie favorite. Palmieri. Yep. Nobody can groove a Montuno like Eddie Palmieri. Nobody. It just, you know, 
in, in a way, though, uh, Prince had his own funk rock pop version of Montuno's, particularly in sure. rehearsals when you guys sure. would jam. I yeah. think of the flesh, some of the flesh sessions, but yeah. obviously you've done way more than that. You know, all these yeah. soundboard recordings that are out there in the, in the YouTube verse, yeah. uh, that you already understood that he had a version of that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And that, you know, yeah. to see if people were paying attention and, and again, control, <laughs> but not wrong with that. Nothing, no, nothing, uh, di- nothing too, except for the style of music that you were doing, nothing too dissimilar about what he was doing and then what you're describing in a Montuno. Yeah. Essentially. It's just, it's basically you just find the groove and you just lay on it. Yeah. You know, um, cool. If you talk about, if you talk about classical music, mm-hmm. Ravel's Bolero. I'll, I'll, 15 minute vamp. Was it meant to be a concert piece either? It was meant to be a warm up piece for orchestra. Yeah. All he, Ravel referred to it as just a long crescendo. Sure. That's what he, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you could go back to Gregorian chant and, and uh, you know, all this other stuff, and you'll find examples of, you know, ground figured bass and stuff like that. I mean, we could yeah. sit, pedal tones, all shit. I mean, it, it, yeah. all my favorite game in the, in life, Eric, and I'm sure it has been for you is, is connect the dots and all these dots connect. And that's, that's the yeah. whole point yeah. of, of having discussions like this with somebody of your caliber, if I, if I may. Um, I just thank thank you so much for all this. I I cannot well, I cannot thank you enough. I could spend another two hours with you, but um, I do want to get your input on on um, what one thing because you ha- I mean there's so much I could I mean I didn't get to any of the family stuff but I'll plug it here. Sure. Both the the family and then F Deluxe. Whoops. Can't yeah, I'm 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 really proud of the F Deluxe of, of the oh. um, uh, the Gas Gaslight CD. Uh, I, yeah. I think that the the writing Paul and Susanna's writing for that music for that album I think is absolutely sensational. Just yeah. just wonderful. You guys played wonderful. Howard University before I you know, and I could not make that in 2011. I could not make that gig. I was so pissed. I got a just t- 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 some insight when we played that gig. That was I forget that was. It was five, six years ago, I guess. Maybe even, no, I think it was back around 2000. God, it was my, my nine or 10 years ago now. Um, yeah, 10. The last time I had been in that theater, the Howard Theater, was in 1966. And I was backstage with Otis Redding. No. <sighs> yeah. God damn. Yeah. These names, man, I'm yeah. telling you, it's like, and I know you don't take that for granted at all. No, You're like, yeah, I sat with Otis Redding. You 1965 know? in Richmond, Virginia, I was at the Moscow Auditorium backstage in the dressing room with Joe Tex, yeah, Solomon Burke, and Stevie Wonder. Shh, young. Three of them kicking it, and I'm 14 years old sitting on the floor in the dressing room just listening to Stevie Wonder, Joe so, Tex, and Solomon Burke just kicking it. How could this? How could you not soak this stuff up, especially if yeah. you're inclined to play this stuff? I mean, yeah. damn. All right, now, little little question about uh, your third album. I would love. I'll, I'll maybe play a little bit of Leeds line to lead us out here, but um, Queens Plaza. Okay. Yeah, and there's a mistake on that. I mistakenly put an apostrophe. It yes. should it should not have a, an apostrophe. It just should be Queens Plaza because it's a subway stop. You're forgiven, my son. You're forgiven. <laughs> All is forgiven. <laughs> like you need my <laughs> blessing, please. But th- that's fine, and I get it because it's a reference to New York. But yeah. it runs primarily on the E train. Now, was that a deliberate reference? Um, if you look that up, it runs. No, the E train it, it, runs it, through there. Yeah, it does, and comes through. I I, I didn't. I didn't think about that at the time. But interesting low, interestingly though, the melody, the melody from it was from a jam session from the E-Train that I had a little cassette of a jam session and a rehearsal with the E-Train a few yeah. years before that. And I it didn't really have a tune, it was just a jam, just a line yeah. that I was played on jam. Yeah. And I just remember the line, so I actually wrote the song years later when, when yeah. I did the album. Let's listen so. to a little snippet, shall we? 
Beats get me every time. Those offbeat. Okay, that's just a sliver. That Mike, Michael Bland. Me. Michael Bland on drums. I, I know. Yeah. I know. Killed oh, it. he's just such a cool. It. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you got to work with some of those guys. Now, um, oh god, god. okay. You know what? Screw it. I got an extra half. Time. You, I've never seen you work outside. Um, so, like for instance, Jelly Bean Johnson, Jelly Uncle Bean, as I like mm -hmm. to call him, and he's been and he, he and his uh, common law partner in crime, Marty, have been very kind and very generous with their time with me when I visited. Yep. And he does Wednesday nights down at the Minnesota Music Cafe out there in St. Paul mm -hmm. with the JB and the Routine. Had you ever sat in on any of those gigs? No, I, I haven't. I, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How much would it cost to make make you make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm playing devil's yeah. advocate. Just this no, is no, my this is it. my wishes to, to, to yeah. you know, I'm projecting yeah. my wishes upon you. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is something I I, I need to say too in, in regards to LP music. Please. Um, Paul and I came came up with that the idea of of doing something like that years and years ago. We had gone to a concert at uh, um, Orchestra Hall here in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and it was, it was Maceo, Maceo and his band, but Christian McBride, who is mm -hmm. a very, very, very dear friend of, of mine, my brothers, and, and, and also Paul, uh, just absolutely, in fact, Christian was just here in town uh, a week and a half ago, we hung mm -hmm. out, it was great, you know. Right. I yes, I saw that, Chris you and your brother went to see him, yes. Yeah. And Christian was doing it was was on that bill, opening up for Maceo with it with a band that he put together with uh, Patrice Russian. I forget it was on drums, but he had a DJ, and it was it was just an it was a pretty much an unrehearsed jam gig, yeah. where Christian was playing more electric bass than anything else, okay. and it was cool. But it was just like okay, they they just kind of put this together, and it's just like hey, we're going to come out, we're going to groove, you know. So there was no real, right, you know. Right. But it was cool. It was fine. Right. We're listening to that. And Paul looks at me and he just kind of says, well, shit, we could do something like that. <laughs> so and thus LP music was born. That, so the initial the initial idea was that we were just going to be a complete jam band. You know, just put a few grooves together, get some guys and go out and just gig, which we did for a while. Yeah. But then, of course, the, comp the composers in both of us started to take over. Yeah. And it became more of, hey, you know, let's do some more with it. And before, you know, we actually got song, we actually got structures, and it's more of a thing. So when it came time to, but here, here's the thing. I met Paul Peterson back in 1984 for the first, yeah. for the family album. Spent yeah. the summer of 85 rehearsing for a tour that never happened. And played at First Avenue only one played, gig. Yeah, the, the one gig. And Paul is 18 or 19 years old, <laughs> singing. And that's pretty much, you know, other than the fact that I knew, you know, had learned about the family that he came from, and his brother, his sisters, Patty and Linda, his brothers, Billy and Ricky, his mother, Jean Arlen Peterson. Um, but that was pretty much the sum total of what I knew about yeah. Paul. Yeah. So Paul exits, you know, finds the exit door and he's out. Years and years later, we would occasionally maybe do a gig or he, you know, might do a gig with him and we just play the family stuff because it's yeah. the only thing that we had in common. Right. Um, so when it comes time years later, you know, when, when we were doing the Gaslight album and I was hanging a lot with Paul when he was doing a lot of the work on that, and I started to realize then, I said, boy, Paul really has a lot to offer as a musician that I don't even have any experience with. Insane. So when it, when it came time to now go in the studio and do the music that yielded this album of ours, No Words, I realized Paul Peterson has to be the baddest MF musician I may have ever 
collaborated with. That's that's no small compliment, by the way. His vocabulary and where he comes from and what he has. Now, it's also luck of the draw because you can have absolutely fabulous musicians that don't necessarily connect. You know, I played with absolutely, you know, wonderful, wonderful musicians that are just tremendous, that are the same. And this just isn't working for me. The energy and the vibe just doesn't. Yeah. And just yeah. A, a particular harmonic way of looking at things or structural is just a particular sure. group, you know, chemistry, whatever that sure. amorphous word means. Mm-hmm. But with Paul, it's like, because having done a lot of music and a lot of production of my own music, pretty much on my own which is fine because I can realize an idea that I might have. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the idea, I pretty much know where it's going to go because I know me. And I can be pretty predictable when it's just me. But when you're now in a dialogue, because I can sit at home and I can talk to myself. (laughs) And I said, you know, I like me. I can have good conversations with myself. But I know if I throw out a phrase, I know what my answer is going to be to my own phrase. This is all me. Once you're talking to somebody else, whatever I say, I can't necessarily predict what the other person's going to say in response. So now I have to react to that. And that's how music is made, or at least should be made. And 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 with Paul, he could take an idea of mine and realize it in a manner that I would not have done on my own devices. But yet and still, it's like, Paul, that's exactly what I would have done, but I needed you to do it because I didn't know that was what I would have done until you did it. And it's not exactly what I would have done, but damn, I can't imagine anything better for what I started with than what, and it goes back and forth. And his vocabulary, harmonically, is absolutely extraordinary. The funny thing is, he does not know the nomenclature because he doesn't really read music and he doesn't have the experiences in the music because he doesn't have, he doesn't have the history or the knowledge because the music that we're making isn't necessarily the music that he grew up listening to, or at least not to the degree that I did. So works. when I throw out a reference and he looks at me like, who? I never heard him. I said, of course he didn't, but it doesn't matter. Because all I know is you're bringing music out of it. And I, I don't know where this is coming from. But damn, if it's, you know, it's not working so well with taking what I might have and taking it and moving it in a different direction. And it allows me to then have the experience and the opportunity to be put in circumstances that I would not be in under my own. And, and, and to your point, uh, to see this visually, I will include a clip that you guys put on the, um, uh, not from LP music, but when you did Leeds line and you did the first rehearsal and you and Paul are there jamming away, you know, you got your keyboards in one hand and when it's time to play your sax, you play the sax and then you go back and play the keys and he's playing mm-hmm. the bass and I hear the laughter that Paul gives and I can tell something's going on there. Oh, with in its question and answer type stuff musically that yeah. you're doing this back and forth yeah. and you can tell it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, OK, I, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. And it's nonverbal in so much as, you know, some grunts and groans and nods and, and, and chuckles and stuff like that. But you listening to one another. And that, you know, you can't put a price on that. I mean, you've no, got no, a, you a, a yeah. classic example of yin and yang. Your yep. yin with your educational not background of knowledge of, of these actual references and the fact mm-hmm. that you read and write and arrange music, you can sit there and take a piece of manuscript paper and put the shit down. Yeah. Whereas he may not be able to imprint same thing, incredible same thing. musical vocabulary, but didn't read or write a, l- a lick of music. Right. I, I, you know, I'd say to Paul, I said, okay. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah well, when it gets to the E flat uh, seventh raised ninth, <laughs> you know, and then he said the what? I said, and, and then and uh, play it, you know, play it on repeat. Oh, is, and, and Paul said, oh, you mean the major minor chord? <laughs> you know, I said, yeah. And there, there, there's one song on, on, on the No Words album, so, song of mine called um, That's All There Is, uh, That's All There Is To It. Yeah. 
which is kind of a Latin jazz song. In fact, a song that I recorded once before on an album with uh, years ago with uh, a tremendous um, Latin jazz trumpet player, Charlie Sepulveda, who was the trumpet player with me in the, in the original E-Train. Oh, wow. And so we worked the song a little bit for, for this album, but when we were um, doing it, I wanted to have um, um, guitar comping, you know, just ba basic. So, you know, so Paul, get your guitar. We need to put some just comping behind the solos. And harmonically, it, it, it wasn't a song that Paul um, that was, wasn't necessarily in his wheelhouse as far as coming up with, with voicings for whatever. Sure. Now, I, I, know, I know pretty much everything I need to know about piano voicings, yeah. but I know next to nothing about guitar voicings. Okay. Which is a whole different thing, you know. Sure is. I play. I know. I get it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sitting at the piano, voicing out certain chords, and I said, I don't know how this works in guitar. So he's figuring out the voicings for it, and coming up with it. And then once he got it under his fingers, these different voicings, because he said, boy, these these are different voicings that I would. He said, I know, but that's what this music, you know, this song calls for. Paul played the thing down like he'd been playing that music all his life. Mm. You know, and it was just absolutely, and I'm in hysterics because I'm, you know, it's, and he's figuring out the voicings on these chords. And of course, I'm starting to laugh with him. I said, yeah, well, that's a raised 11. I said, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, well, it means to just put a B in there. You got to put a, you know, it's an, it's an F7 chord, but you need to put a B in there because it's a raised 11th. Yeah. So, you know, so he's hunting and find, oh, oh, this chord. Oh, yeah. And it's something that he's probably played a hundred times, you know. But, but in the you context, have two of, different ways. Of, you have two different definitions and two way, two different ways of getting there. That's great. Exactly. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, he can come up with an orchestral pattern. Yeah. That is so sophisticated in its voicing and its voice leading, and he has an ability to do string parts yeah. Yeah. that sound so authentic, and that's something that is usually learned. And instinctively, I said, well, where in the world do you even learn the, you know, the basic voicings of how to make it sound? Sometimes he just laughs at, oh, I got that from my mom. Blame it on my family, something to yeah. that degree. You I've know, heard him yeah. say stuff like that before. Uh, so, yeah. but, you know, watch, you know, I, I, I want, I want, you know, I'm just being selfish. I'd love to see him take the St. Paul, Minneapolis Stars, All-Stars thing and take it on the road. I know the feasibility of that may not be. You know, I know yeah. they're doing Las Vegas and doing a couple local gigs in, in your area. Yeah. But, you know, the East Coast would love to have you all, too. I'm just saying, throw it out I, there. Yeah. yeah. Ardmore Music Hall uh, outside of Philadelphia and Ardmore, oh. PA. Yeah. I used saw to play, an, used to play, play there. Used to play a club called the Ardmore Cafe with Billy Price all the time. Oh, shit. Okay. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, Eric, thank you. Thank you for coming sure, on you. here and, and thank you so much for I, I, this. It's a lovely discussion. It just to talk to somebody with your musical intelligence and all that, all that comes with it. And, and not the fact that I like hearing you play, <laughs> that helps. Oh. Uh, you know, I I've really come to appreciate a lot of these jazz artists and I, you know, just I'll dedicate today's episode to the memory of Wayne shorter. Cause I know how much it meant to you. Yeah. And what a humongous loss in the in the jazz world and music. Well, world what, what, on on one of the you know the uh, um, dream come true um, situations for me and, and and one of these things you never forget. In 1972, December 1972, I was in Pittsburgh at my first jazz band. We called ourselves Matrix. There was actually a band from New York called the Matrix at the same time that actually had a couple albums. So ours was, you know, had nothing to do with it. Was yeah, just, right. You know, okay. What do you, you know, need a name for the band? How about Matrix? Okay, that's the name of the band. And in December of 1972, we found ourselves in the opportunity to open up a concert at the Syria Mosque in Pittsburgh for Weather Report yeah. and Ross and Roland Kirk and his band. Yes. Ross and Roland Kirk, one of the iconic jazz saxophone players in the history of the music as i come to learn yes yep yeah and one of my favorites growing up and of course weather report which was oh, probably more than any other musical entity attempt late for so much of what i have aspired to do musically structurally pre, pre jacko pistorius right he jacko came later 
he came later. This was this was actually the first iteration of the band with Eric Robot on drums, Miroslav Vitus on bass. Mm -hmm. um, and we did our little set for about a half hour or whatever. Somewhere during the rest of the evening, me and my band, we were in, in our little dressing room, we were backstage or whatever. I look up and standing in the doorway are two of my biggest musical heroes of all time, Wayne Shorter and Joe Zavano. Wow. Joe Zavano looked in the room and he said to us, he said, uh, I think I was nearest the door. So he's kind of looking at me, but he was looking, you know, saying to all of us, yeah. he said, you, you, you guys were, were the band that uh, played first. And I kind of looked at him and I, <laughs> because he was a hero of mine, I also knew a lot about Joe Zavano. And I know that he was had a reputation for not suffering fools. Yeah. There was a part of me that always almost expected him to look at us and say, "Kids, don't quit your day job." Right, right. Fortunately, right. he didn't say that. He looked and he said, yeah. "You guys, whatever, you know, thumbs up." He said, "Man, you cats got something. You 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 cats keep at it. You got some you, you, you got some bad shit going on there." Wayne didn't say anything. He just kind of smiled and nodded his head. And I don't remember anything about what we played that night. I remember that. Does it really matter at the end of the day? You got a nugget from that experience. Ugh, the fact that you're in the uh, the fact that you're in the same room with those guys just. Uh, I mean, now, of course, of course, it, it, you know the other part of that is then a, a month later they were playing at a club in Cleveland, so me and my buddy we drove up to Cleveland to see the gig. Okay, and I'm sitting at the bar oh, cool. between sets with Zavanol, and mentioned something about you know. I was in the band a month ago in Pittsburgh and he kind of looked at him. He says, you know, man, we do a lot of gigs. I'm not sure I remember that one. <laughs> so it was like, you know, Joe, it doesn't matter. Yeah, right. <laughs> All I remember is on that night, this is what you said. So thank you very much. You know, well, you know, it's like when people <laughs> would ask you, Hey, remember when you did the love sexy tour and you played, like, if I said, do you remember what happened September 30th, uh, 1988? You're like, kid, let me tell you something. <laughs> I almost feel like a Harrison Ford moment there, you know? Kid, yeah. let me tell you something. Yeah. I've done a lot of gigs. And, and and it's true, and you're not trying yeah. to be mean or cruel about it, but, you know, like you said, the Love Sexy Tour was a blur because blur. Blur. you're doing a, a structured yeah. thing every night. So, yeah, you know, it was a, it was a they, theatrical they, performance. Maybe they weren't right. Well, that was yeah. as close to Broadway as he ever came. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, the, yeah. the technical, I can't even. Okay. I could, I could, I could, I could give you a half hour just on the production rehearsals for that. They were a nightmare, I, just without. Yeah, I'm yeah. surprised. He, um, maybe his heels got uh, stuck in the one of the. the... <laughs> well, any, every, any, and everything that could go wrong went wrong on the production rehearsals, and we were running out of time. And it was one of those points where I actually thought Prince was sitting there thinking, maybe I bit off more than I could chew with this one. You know. But I tell you, those of us that got to see that that show, and I know it was a money loser, and your brother goes into this whole interview thing about how when he decided to play at one half of the year versus the other half, yeah, flip, he would have made flip, more flip money this. if he flipped it over because Madonna right. and Michael Jackson were playing Europe at the same time. You guys yeah. were playing. Yeah. I mean... But the artiste was, said no. no yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, I've well, talked to, to Hockey to, Austin about some of the uh, gigs during the Isis Kurt. You well, my, my favorite story about that, that point, about everything being a blur about that. Okay. Me and Maceo once were sitting having lunch. This was, you know, back around 2002 when I was doing those one night alone gigs. Yes, filling in. You know, only did a handful because I was just subbing. Yeah, but there was, sub. but yep. but what, what we did a week in in, in um, Japan, where it was me and Maceo and Greg in the horn section, and those were probably maybe the most enjoyable gigs I ever did with Prince. Candy you Dolfer know. was in that as well. Uh, she was doing some gigs, but she was not on that. Alternating one. between you. Alternate, yeah. Because there's that C note album that NPG Music had put out some years ago, and I and you're on some of the track. It's like warm ups. Yeah. Right. Right. Some anyway, there. me and me, and Macy are kicking it. Yeah. We're sitting having lunch one day and whatever. And yeah. I just happened to have just talking about back in the day. Yeah. Um, Macy would join James Brown's band in the spring of 1964 playing yeah. baritone saxophone. That's what he played first with James. Yeah. Yeah. He was with James for a little over a year. 
Midsummer 1965, he gets drafted, goes into the service, spends most of his service overseas playing in, in service bands. Yeah. He gets released from the army in spring of 1967, yeah. immediately goes back working with James Brown, playing t all tenor now. Yeah. The very first recording session in May of 1967 that he was involved in coming back was Cold Sweat, the song Shit. Cold Sweat, the most, one of the most iconic songs in the history of American popular music. Sure. So I'm just laughing. I said, yeah, that's the only thing you get out of the service. You go back, right back to James in 67 and you're right back. And first thing you're doing is Cold Sweat. And Maceo looks at me and says, no, Eric, that was 1968. I got out of the service in 68. And I looked at Macy and I said, that's funny. Because Maceo, you're wrong. I got out of the surface in 67. And he looked at me and he started, he was laughing, but he was starting to get a little, a little like, Eric, you know, um, love you, but like, you're going to tell me about my life? And I laughed and I said, Macy, I'm sorry. It was 1967. And I started giving him the discography. May 1967, you recorded Cold Sweat. It was released on June 25th, 1967. The same night you were at the Apollo Theater recording Live at the Apollo, Volume 2. Uh. In, in October of 1967, the next song, Get It Together, blah, 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 blah. I gave him the next year and a half of all the releases. <laughs> and I said, Maceo, you can look it up. I said, you got out of the service in May of 1967. So he's sitting there kind of stewing over this. <laughs> Meanwhile, somebody else walks in the room and sits, sits down and asks Maceo a question about something. And Maceo looks at it and says, ask Eric. He knows more about my life than I do. Because now, you know, you, you talk about being on the road. Yeah. You know, he's on the road with James Brown. They're playing oh, 300 man. gigs a year, year oh, after year after year. Oh, you ask him, of, of course it's a blur. But that's the difference. That's why I can understand the Prince fanatics sure. that know everything about this that I don't know, because I'm now Maceo in that situation. And you tell me something. And I said, I don't know if that was 67, 68, you know, 86, 87, 88. I don't know. You tell me. I'll take you, your word for it. You're not ashamed to admit that you might want to look up on Prince Vault if somebody asks you a question. Hold on, let me let me hold on, let me look that up. Well, it's, let's, it's, let's face it. You, yeah. When you're when you're in it, we're we're looking on the outside in. When you're in that actual world, you're not worried about when you did something on a particular date. You're there to yeah. do a job. My job. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. So I understood why Maceo was was confused, but but that's the point. But to see the thing is, <laughs> the fanat, you know, I understand yeah. the fanaticism about yeah. Prince with the fans because that's what I was and am about James Brown. Uh, who can fault you for that? Yeah. Who can because fault you that, for that? You know, James Brown in that regard, he was my prince. So it sure was. You know, yeah. Well, on that note, I'm going to close. And say thank and 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 if you if maybe at some point if you'd like to come back on, I'd you, love to you have you back. I'm, I'm, you know, I could chin wag. I could, as the Brits say, I could chin wag with you. Onto the we haven't Hall. really gotten into Eddie Palmer like I would, or Weather Report, or Miles, or Ray uh, Charles. Okay, because, you know. Okay, ready. <laughs> so, so we're gonna have some links, and and the people can find you most. Uh, uh, easily at? Um, well, me, I do have a website of my own, ericleads.com. It's yeah. one of those websites that, that there is, there isn't a, there's some stuff up there. It's not one of those things I update a lot. No. So, but there That's is okay. some basic stuff up there. Leads, leads, Peterson yes. yes. Is the other one. We'll and have that's, that up on the links. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll have some examples of what we were talking about today as well, but, um, I'll give you dealers. Uh, it'll be. Uh, I'm going to do dealers' choice here, uh, rather than do dealers' choice. I, I meant to say is, um, I'm going to give you a track that we'll we'll close out over. Uh, it can either be yours or, um, okay, ready here. I'm, I got I got your choice. Okay. Give it up or turn it loose. What I'd say live in Stockholm '72, Fat Head. Newman playing Fathead, mm -hmm. Condiciones of Palmieri, Seventh Arrow, Weather Report, or the Three Marias, Wayne Shorter. Oh, um, <laughs> oh okay. 
I'm going to choose give it up. And I'll tell you why. And I told you that I wouldn't be able to hang with James Brown in his yes. dressing room after gigs because James Brown would not get in a car and leave the venue. He would go to his dressing room and hang out. And, and, and back in the day, he would always have test pressings of his next record. And he always had a little portable stereo phonograph on the road with him set up yeah. in his dressing room. Yeah. And in 1968, yeah. he's in Pittsburgh playing the Civic Arena and I'm hanging with him during the concert, the band is playing, one of the supporting acts is playing, and I'm in the dressing room with him, and he's playing me some of his newest stuff, some album cuts, some jam blues jams, and, one, and I'm just listening. I said, okay, Mr. Brown, that's cool, but I know you got the new one, right? And he said, Rick, he called me Rick. That was my name, my nickname yeah, back then. He said, Rick, yeah. just cut this two weeks ago. It'll probably be out in two or three weeks. He drops the needle. <laughs> And I'm sitting there with James Brown listening to Give It Up or Turn It Loose. Nobody else has heard that yet. That's what I remember. And, <laughs> so, and play, with, so on that note, yeah. play, play, yep. Yeah. And that's so sampled, right? Oh, yeah. I, and they'll probably block this on YouTube, but who cares? You and I can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> With that, I would like to thank my special guest today, Eric Leeds. Eric, thank you so much for coming. I will have sure. you back. If you'll have me, I will have you back on in a heartbeat. And when you get to Richmond, uh, uh, we're going we're to come down there and chop it up in person. Oh. And uh, yeah. uh, hopefully. And, uh, you know, I'd love to see your record collection. Just saying. And, or your train books collection. Whatever the hell. I, see, I, I want you to pull something out and just, uh, you know. Pull a record out. See what you got. What does Eric got? Just, just like. Oh damn! Let me stop this thing. Come on, there you go. Yeah, speed. Ooh, <laughs> ooh. No. Oh, I, I, you know, I'd like to tell you I had ESP when I knew what you were gonna pick out of the tracks that I picked, but I kind of set it up because that was uh, of those tracks that I pick, I had that as my first pick that you were gonna pick. Ah, How can I'll you not? Picked. You there got you to go. hear that three weeks before anybody else probably got to hear it, or yeah. whoever in town. Maybe a handful yeah. of people got to hear that. And, and he would he would stare at me, He'd stare because he wanted to get my reaction, you know. And I'm just what what am I going to do? I'm just like I'm just yeah. looking and said, oh shit, you know. And and James he said, eh, hey, Rick, I got you, you know, I got you, <laughs> you know. Man, all right, folks, <laughs> if you like what you heard today, I, I I'm going to tell you what I I. I I literally am going to look at the transcription of this and I'm going to have to write down the, the, the probably the 30 or 40 artists you just dropped in there. I'm like, who? Okay, I'm going to write that shit down and listen to it. You're overloading my iPod. I still have an iPod, 256 gig iPod. And the majority of these are references of shit that you said. So uh, in the best possible way. So folks, next time we get him on, we're going to deep dive into like Eddie Palmieri and why he's the greatest musician on earth to Eric and the fact that as we're my favorite saxophone, my favorite living saxophone, I can go off on the Brantford Marcellus. Brand my dear friend Marcellus. and Brantford is my guy. It, yeah. Was that the reason? Okay, I'm gonna throw another question in. Damn it, see, dude, I, I love it though. <laughs> is that why you chose Fragile off your third album now and again? Because Sting, Brantford Marcellus was playing for, for Sting at that yeah, point. Yeah, um, no, it was just it was just something we we the great tune. That was that was actually going to go on, on an F Deluxe album that we did a cover it's called um that that album AM that we Static. did AM, AM Static. Static yeah and then we decided that it didn't really um didn't work with the rest of the stuff wow. so we decided not to use it so but but I think it's up on YouTube I think all right folks yeah if you like what you hear hit like and subscribe until next time and there will be a next time uh keep it on the two and the four and stay funky